You're not really over Rupert, are you? No. <laughs> What it is guys, it's your boy Blossomus HD, and today we're gonna check out every single one of Brian and Stewie's craziest moments all wrapped up into one video. Now I'm gonna keep my game face on, try not to laugh, but we gonna go for it. Not laughing at funny stuff is harder than not being scared at scary stuff. Don't even know if that makes sense. Let's do this. Every Brian and Stewie episode in one video. Let's kick things off with the first Road 2 episode, Road to Rhode Island. An absolute classic. The episode opens with Brian having a little therapy session. Brian, you really seem to be enjoying your wine lately. It's only my second glass. If you're wondering where Stewie is, he's visiting Carter and Babs in California. So, Brian feeling bored, volunteers to pick Stewie up. One thing to note here is that Brian and Stewie aren't friends yet. Quite the contrast to their iconic friendship in later seasons. I sound like a nerd, but yeah, it's interesting. Stewie, gather your things. Time to go. Well, it's about bloody time. You fat idiot Slatton sent the dog. Oh, I won't even begin to, 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 to. Can we go? Fine. Aren't you a little young to be traveling alone? Aren't you a little old to be wearing braces? <laughs> oh, here's a pleasant sight. Cirrhosis the Wonder Dog. I'm, I'm not drunk. W where, where are the bags? What the deuce do you mean, where are the bags? They're right in... Rupert, I tell you to watch the bags. Don't forget it. Let's just get on the bloody plane and go home. Our tickets were in the bags. Hey! Oh! That was my plan. Where's yours? I don't know who's more of an idiot. Stewie for thinking that sh would work, or Brian for leaving an infant alone in the airport. Nonetheless, the duo are forced to crash at a nasty motel for the night. Real f responsible, Brian. You got the stuff? Yeah, I got it. Where's the money? You don't see the money till I see the stuff. He's wearing a wire! You son of a- Oh! What? What do you mean our credit card was declined? Oh, no, 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 there's no need to come up. Come on, you get up. Come on, go for a ride in the car. Where did he go? Wake up! What, what, oh, Ooh. what, oh, my head. We have to get the hell out of here! Open up, or I'll hit you with this blunt instrument I used to hit deadbeats with bad credit cards. Let's go. All right, we need some wheels. That was close. Also, we get a good look at the blunt object the hotel manager spent an entire minute describing, and that would have really hurt. After this, we see Brian lie to Lois on the phone, and after the police book their stolen car, they flee the scene. They try to escape with this plane, but fail miserably, so they're forced to hide in this truck to get back home. That's why my tomatoes haven't been coming in. Hola, uh, me, me amo es Brian. Nosotros... Queremos ir con ustedes. Yeah, that was pretty good. But actually, when you said me llamo Ace Brian, you don't need the ace. Oh, you speak English. No, just that first speech and this one explaining it. You're kidding, right? Que? Okay. Senor, pare el auto. My mother lives in Austin. Bates brought me back here for a reason. I have to find my mother and make peace with her. Hello, Luke. My name's Brian. I was born here. I was the one who could talk. Brian, come on in. Oh, and you brought a little friend. Now change me. It seems like this is going to be a heartwarming moment, right? Well, Brian's hopes of being reunited with his mother are smashed to pieces when it's revealed that she recently passed away. Brian, your mama gave you up because she thought you'd have a better life if she let you go. Would you like to see her? See her? I don't understand. Well, we love Biscuit so much, we wanted to keep her with us always. So we had her stuff. Mom, someone must have said a funny because your mother's in stitches. <laughs> you deserve better than this, what? Mom. You, you know, this is actually a rather elegant solution for my problem of what to do with Lewis. <laughs> Old girl doesn't have too much to wag about these days anyway. On the trip home, we really see Stewie oh. and Brian bond. We even get to see their first musical number together, which I once again cannot play. Disney will hunt my entire family down. But yeah, it's a beautiful moment. Next up is Road to the North Pole. The episode kicks off with a musical number going over what everyone wants for Christmas. Peter wants Jessica Peel and Megan Fox wearing nothing but socks. Stewie wants some uranium. Lois wants a drug-induced trip to Mexico. Chris wants skates. And Meg wants- That reminds me of one of Young Child Support's Christmas songs. All I want for Christmas is nudes. It's a, it's a love song. Just- you know, we gonna edit that out. The voice is in her head to stop. But how does Brian feel about all this? It seems a bit excessive. Brian, don't ruin Christmas, dude. In the next scene, we see Stewie and Brian shopping at the mall. And when they run into Quagmire, Brian makes a hilarious f mistake. Glenn? Wow, what, what are you doing here? Waiting for Santa like everyone else. Here, who's this little guy, huh? Is this your nephew? I hope you've been a good boy this year. That little guy is my niece, Abby, you douche. Real f smooth, Brian. No wonder 
Quagmire hates your guts. The line to see Santa is massive, and unfortunately, after two hours, this happens. Doesn't the mall close soon? We've been here forever. Would you relax? We're right here. I'm next. Hello, Santa. Now, um, we've got a slight problem here because I have been rather naughty. I'm sure we can work something out. Wait, what are you doing? Sorry, I'm done. You want your kid to sit on my lap? Meet me at the bar at Applebee's. Hey, give me your keys. I need your car. What? You're not taking my car. Right, driving you where? To the North Pole to see Santa Claus. Yeah, dude. We're headed to the North Pole. Or are we? Hey, Stewie, wake up. We're at the North Pole. North Pole. North Pole! There it is! Ah, look at this. The tip of the earth, Brian. Okay, let's go see Santa Claus. All right, let's go. Yo, yo, what's up, y'all? Y'all's ready to kick it in some fine North Pole gear? Brian? Why does the North Pole have black teenagers? From, uh, Katrina? Ah, of course. All right. Do you think I'm an idiot? Ha! Huh? Do you? Look, Stewie, the North Pole is a long and dangerous... You can't jerk oh. me around when it comes to Santa Claus, Brian! Now you get your ass back into that hippie car of yours and take me to the North Pole! Now! This was never about Christmas presents, Brian. I'm going to kill Santa Claus. I remember one year I really wanted SmackDown vs. Raw on the PlayStation 2, and Santa did not pull through. So I completely support Stewie's decision. The problem, though, is that Brian doesn't, so Stewie ditches his ass. Journey? What? Stewie? Say yes to life, Brian! What are we hauling, good buddy? Oh, I got a flock of birds that were too tired to fly back north. What is this? Don't, don't touch that. Oh, it's a flare gun. Is this the trigger? Oh. Oh. How do you make these level of mistakes, Stewie? Come on, man. You've got to... You've got to not. Oh my god, Stewie, you all right? What the hell happened? Ah, just some stupid stuff went down. Stewie, what the f***? Man. To continue the trip, he goes to hitch a ride, and this causes Brian to do something drastic. I'm gonna keep heading north until I find Santa. You're not gonna find him. I'm gonna kill that bastard. You're not oh. gonna kill Santa Claus because he doesn't exist. <laughs> re re really, Brian? Who else isn't real? Hmm? You gonna tell me that Elmo isn't real? Educate yourself, you fool. I'll tell you what. You take me to the North Pole, and if Santa isn't there, I'll do something for you. When Lois does that middle-of-the-night feeding where she doesn't even open her eyes or really wake up, I'll let you take that one for me, Brian. Okay, you got a deal. Ah, damn it, it won't turn over. Not even halfway through Canada and we're stuck. Oh, hey there. You having some car troubles, eh? Stewie, I think he's just a drunk. Well, drunk or not, can you help us? I can if you want to join AA, eh? No, I'm already a member of AAA. I need help with the car. Look, we, we don't have enough cash to fix the car, and we're kind of on our way to the North Pole. Oh, a car won't take you there anyway. But if you like, you can take my snowmobile. Really? That's what Canadian hospitality is all about. If you like, you can have all my money and my leg. Okay. I'm a Canadian boy, and I would also give all of you my money and my leg. Only if you can subscribe, though. Anyway, the only thing that could make this funnier would be if Santa actually turns out to be real, right? Well, Brian, you ain't gonna be sucking on any titties, my guy. My God! At least let we made it, be female Brian. Titties. I don't believe it. It's here. Nowadays, some of these people questionable. This can't be Santa's workshop. This looks like Bridgeport, Connecticut. I'm not leaving until Gotta Santa Claus is dead by my hand. Yep. Gotta murder him. Oh, you look sad. Oh. You're Santa Claus. Yeah. I'm Stewie Griffin. And I'm going to kill you! Oh. Thank God. Why does Santa look like a crackhead? He looks like my mother. It turns out, Santa is completely overworked and is struggling to keep up. He's been inbreeding elves, producing toxic waste, and the North Pole is a complete shit show. Even the reindeer have turned into bloodthirsty monsters. We get a very dark musical number that I'm not going to play as if I did. Fox would f***ing spirit bomb my channel, but it ends with Santa nearly dying. I don't know, boys. He's in rough shape. He can't keep this pace up anymore. If he goes out tonight, he'll die. Who's gonna deliver all the presents? We will. Don't worry, Santa. We'll make sure there's a Christmas this year. Thank you, Brian. That brings me peace in this hour. I'll be with Allah soon. What? Uh, he doesn't know what he's saying. He's delirious. Stewie, let's go get the sleigh ready. Is anyone else a little freaked out by that Allah thing? Giddy up. Come on, you dumb deer. I think they need to be coaxed. Um, oh, oh, excuse me. Uh, sir? Mr. Elf? Sir? I don't think he even knows where he is. Do, do you want to just... Might as well take a souvenir. Bye. This is the best... 
Christmas special I've ever seen, dude. After a crash landing, they do their first house. Now let's get down the chimney. Ow! Bitch! All right, you have them? I thought you had them. They're still in a sleigh! Oh my god. Didn't you unlock the door when we left? No, you were the last one out. All right, find a rock. Stewie and oh. Brian are not good at this. They argue over the placement of presents. Brian eats the cookies left for Santa. And after they make a mess in the kitchen, this happens. Aw, oh, man. You jackass! Hey, who the hell are you? We are Santa Claus. That's why you broke in through the window. I'm calling the cops. Ooh. What the hell did you do? Ooh, he was going to call the, the cops, man. Oh. There's got to be another way, baby. Dude, he's still alive. Oh, come on, baby. Oh, tie him up. I'm going to make it look like a burglary. Oh, at least don't make it look like black guys, did it? I want a drink of water. In the end, Stewie and Brian interrupt a news broadcast to reveal the truth. Santa is overworked, looks like a crackhead, and something needs to change. This episode is definitely the darkest Christmas special I've ever seen. Woodland Critters Christmas from South Park is up there, but this one tops it for me. Next up is Road to the Multiverse. Another banger. Stewie is always cooking up new inventions, and in this episode, he creates a remote that allows the user to travel between alternate universes. It's pretty f sweet. This is it, Brian. You ever heard of the multiverse theory, Brian? Well, of course I have. Oh my god, so transparent. Every possible eventuality exists. And that's where you got the pig in a parallel universe. Prepare yourself, Brian, and I'll show you. This is Cohort, Brian. Same year, same time. But in this universe, Christianity never existed. What time do you suppose it is, Brian? I don't know, about 3.30. Watch the sidewalk. My God, is that Meg? 36D, Brian. And you know what's amazing? In this universe, she's still one of the ugly ones. This episode is really good, dude. We get to see all sorts of alternate universes, ranging from the Flintstones to even a Japanese version of Spooner Street. The next universe they visit, though, is weird. Ah, <sighs> home sweet home. Peter? Peter? What? What? Can you take out the trash? Sure thing, Lois. Delighted to. I get tired when I stand. <gasps> What the hell is this? Oh, this is too freaky. Why didn't that thing take us home? Dewey, please tell me you know how to get us home. Of course I know how to get us home. Stewie, what's going on? The next oh, stop no. is a Disney-inspired universe. And holy sh**, look at that animation, dude. Family Guy is known for lazy animation 90% of the time, but this three-minute scene is beautiful. My favorite from this episode, though, is where Stewie and Brian are headed next. Whoa, this is trippy. You're in the robot chicken universe. Oh, robot chicken. G.I. Joe Transformers Thundercats He-Man. How's it feel to be on a major network for 30 seconds? <laughs> Yo! Bye. I oh. love robot chicken. Where are we headed next, though, Stewie? Ew, where are we? I don't know. The device can't make heads or tails of it. Yeah. 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 I'm frightened. Let's go. Love it. Hate it. Love it. Hate it. Hate it. Uh, Brian? This feels weird. The duo eventually stumble upon Brian's dream world, a universe where instead of humans owning dogs, dogs own humans. And of course, when Brian realizes this, he breaks the f***ing teleportation device. I'm a new neighbor and you're my pet human, Hotchkiss. Got it? Oh my god, I know that sound! That means there's a potential intruder at the front door of one of my pals. Either way, I'm really excited and ready for anything! Hello? We just moved in down the street and thought we'd stop in and say hi to our new neighbors. Well, great to meet you. Come on in, I'm Peter. I know who you are, Stewie. I beg your pardon? I've perfected multiverse travel as well. Oh my god, who is it? I got it! Oh. Morning, Peter. Hey, Joe. That's Joe. He's our local human catcher. So don't misbehave or the human catcher will come after you, Gabe. My name's not Gabe! <gasps> Ow! You just earned yourself a trip to the pound! Brian! Brian, do something! These were like five minutes away from being sent back home, but this kid has to bite someone. Well, don't worry. Dog Stewie has a plan. Look, there he is! Oh, thank God I'm saved! All right, the two of you stand over there, and I'll send you back where you belong. Hey! Get away from there! The episode ends with human Brian getting hit by a car, but all that matters is that Stewie and Brian are home. This next episode is one of my personal favorites, season five's Road to Rupert. The episode kicks off with Brian making another massive mistake. Give you a dollar for this. Sold. Brian, where's Rupert? 
I just left him here to watch my things. I haven't seen him. Rupert! What if he's been kidnapped? What if he's dead? I don't think I can handle a funeral. This f sold Rupert? Stewie should beat him up again. Stewie has had many weird relationships throughout Family Guy history, but Rupert is the little freak's soulmate. What the hell's wrong with you? I'm so distraught over losing Rupert. I needed something to calm me down. Why have you brought me to the toy store, Brian? I'm buying you another Rupert. You can't just take some Korean-made velveteen primate and call it Rupert. <sighs> Look, I, uh, Rupert wasn't kidnapped. I accidentally sold him at the yard sale. <gasps> You son of a bitch! Come on, Stewie, I'm really sorry. It was an accident. What you've done is more horrible than sex with Sharon Stone. The duo oh. does some serious research, eventually finding the address of the individual Rupert was sold to. But when they arrive, the oh, situation turns Sharon into Stone an even do. <laughs> Sharon Stone don't deserve that. We're gaining on him. Unless she does. I'm sorry, but I can go no further. If I enter Connecticut, I'm entering every state that Connecticut's ever been with. No! We were so close! I say, what a bit of serendipity. Aspen, Colorado. We're not going all the way to Aspen. But I can't leave Rupert to perish. Don't you think at some point you're going to have to let Rupert go? Fine, then. I'll go by myself. Try explaining this to Lois. Now, are you coming or not? <sighs> Fine. This is where the plot really heats up. Stewie is desperate to get Rupert back. And after traveling throughout the entire US, the pair perform another show tune in exchange for a helicopter. It turns out the family that bought Rupert lives in Aspen, making the trip even more complicated. <laughs> Because the mountains are the same color as the sky. Whoa! What the hell was that? I'm practicing my comedy crash. Well, keep it down, because I'm trying to. Whoa! 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 Oh, hell no! Oh, no! Imagine the dance I'm gonna have to do to get our security deposit back. It's Aspen! We made it! From here, it should be smooth sailing, right? Nope. Well, this is the place. Can I help you? My name's Brian. Um, I accidentally sold you a teddy bear back in Rhode Island. I kinda need it back. Rupert! It's- it's Rupert! Stanford, who is it? I'm sorry, but that bear belongs to Timmy. Wait, wait! How about a ski-off? If I win, I get Rupert. What do I get if I win? My dog. Hmm. All right. It's a deal. If only I had rockets in my skis. Oh wait, I totally have rockets in my skis. <laughs> well, that's it, I suppose. Sometimes I laugh at how much they nerfed Stewie in later seasons. But after losing the race, we get a taste of older Stewie just before the episode ends. You were right. Maybe I, I am getting too old for Rupert. I guess I've just got to let him go. Hey, dog, let's go. My dad won you fair and square. You're oh. not really going to live with them, are you? No, you're not really over Rupert, are you? No. <laughs> If you're a true Family Guy fan, then you know that Stewie's favorite show is Jolly Farm, a British kids show. Well, in Road to Europe, Stewie becomes a little too obsessed. I say it's four o'clock. Away with you. Stewie! Take it back! Shut up! I should be there, not here! London. Calm down, Stewie. Let's not get any crazy ideas. Hey, Stewie, what do you want for lunch? Dear stupid dog, I've gone to live with the children on Jolly Farm. Oh my god! Cue up, children. Spit spot. Well, come on! <clears throat> what the hell are you doing here? I'm taking you off this plane. We're in England. Uh-oh. We're in the Middle East. The boys are trapped in the Middle East, and just like Road to Rupert, they trade a little show tune in exchange for transportation. This unfortunately also falls through, leaving Stewie and Brian trapped in the middle of the desert. Luckily for them, they randomly run into a Holiday Inn. How in the hell are we gonna get out of here? No more balloon for you! I am sick of you tooling around the village in that thing. Go to your palace! Let's take it. Wow. After a hilarious encounter with the Pope, the boys find themselves crash landed in Rome. Brian is fed up with Stewie's bullshit at this point, but decides that they've come this far, they might as well finish the trip to Jolly Farm. They hop on the train, and from here the duo go through numerous areas in Europe. They get faded in Amsterdam, argue with Germans in Germany, and eventually make their way to the UK. The BBC. Well, this is it. I'll say goodbye to you now. Well, have a good life, Stewie. Oh, I shall. <gasps> oh, there's Happy Hill. Oh, the deuce! Pengrove, I've come to live on Jolly Farm! I... <laughs> Dead Brill, eh? Ah! The worst, though, is when Stewie meets Mother Maggie. 
Oh, Mother Maggie, thank God. Kiss off, you grotty little wanker. Oh, what's up, Our grotty next episode, mean? Road to Germany, starts with Mort being a complete dumbass and stumbling into Stewie's time machine. Mort? Hey, 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 hey. What are you doing in my room? I'm looking for Mort. He came up here an hour ago and never came back down. My time machine has been activated. I don't know you had a time machine. Oh, my God, Stewie, we have to get him back. Where did the machine send him? I don't know. How can you not know? Oh, I'm sorry, Brian. Is my time machine not as good as your time machine? You probably got a way better time machine. Yeah, stupid dog. The issue here is for Mort to come back, he needs a return pad. So it's up to Stewie and Brian to save the f***. The first stop is Europe, and after following his tissue paper trail, Brian and Stewie find him. Uh, excuse me, we're, we're looking for a Mr. Goldman? Mr. Mort Goldman? He's a small business owner, tends to whine a lot, kind of a hypochondriac. No, oh, no, you, you can't put your hand back up after you've put it down. I now pronounce you man and wife. Mazel tov. Now step on the glass. Oh, but be careful, though. Oh, Mort, thank God. You're in heaven, too? You've time-traveled into the past. H how is that possible? Come on, Mort, we gotta get out of here. But, Brian, when am I gonna have another chance to see my grandpa Chaim's wedding with my own eyes? I guess we could stay a little longer. Yeah, what's about to happen is really f***ed up. I'm just gonna play the clips. Uh-oh. That's f***ing crazy. The army eventually targets Brian and Stewie, so they flee along with Mort, giving us another badass chase scene. hits the fan. The boys hijack a submarine and successfully escape. However, the time machine is still not working. Turns out the entire thing is powered by uranium and Stewie is out, so they have one last mission. The transfer circuits are powered by uranium and this thing is tapped out. There's only one place at the top secret atomic research facility. Berlin is the closest place we're going to find uranium in this time. Pardon me, sir. I'd like to join. What are your qualifications? I have a British accent. I'm possibly homosexual. I never brush my teeth and my wife is ghastly. <laughs> Talk to me, Goose. Please don't call me that. What the f*** is this dude doing? I don't know, but I think it's time for some reinforcements. Run! Die! What the hell? Is that Wonder Woman 1922 with this? Jesus, we're going down! Oh. There are no parachutes. All I could find was this. A raft? We're not sinking! We're not sinking! In the episode's final act, the three make it to Berlin and try to break into the uranium lab. But of course, a certain someone has to show up. I don't suppose you boys have some uranium I could borrow? Of course! Hey kid, catch! Thanks, Mean Joe! Let's find a safe spot and make the trip back home. At least he didn't throw his jockstrap like in the previous one. Arrest him! Arrest all three! These Ew. filths are making a mockery of our Reich! Will you two just get in the time machine? Next up is season 14's Road to India. Before we get into it though, I'm gonna be a nerd again. This was actually the last Road 2 episode. I don't know why, but maybe we'll get a new one in the future. It's been like 8 plus seasons since, but give me some ideas in the comments. Imagine Road to Japan. That shit would slap. Anyway, the episode starts with Brian falling in love with an Indian customer support worker. He has no idea how the girl looks, or if she's even real, but our boy is whipped. Thank you for holding. How can I help you? You can keep talking with that lovely accent. You sound like a perfect gentleman to me. My name is Padma. My computer froze right in the middle of a story I'm writing. Oh, you you are a writer? Are you famous? By choice, no. Fame brings a lot of unwanted attention. You know, Padma, I love Indian food, but I'd have to say my least favorite curry is Am. So, are you done rebooting? Look, I, I, I have to come clean. Um, I just wanted to talk to you again. I like talking to you too, Brian. You're from different worlds. She's in India. That's a lot to overcome. People in love can overcome anything. I guess Brian wants some curry for his rice. You can't blame the guy. Wanting to travel all the way to another country to meet her though? Now that's a little crazy. We finally made it, Brian. We're in India. Let's go find Padma. I can already smell the enlightenment and tranquility. <laughs> oh, 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 this is wonderful. 
wonderful, isn't it, Brian? Brian is committed to tracking down Padma and learns they need to take a train to find her. Of course, dragging along Stewie for the ride. Imagine if Lois found this shit out. Her dog taking her baby to India just to bang a random girl he's never even seen before. Brian is going to be locked in his kennel for months after this shit. Do you think all those chickens had to buy tickets? I don't know, but I'm starving. What I wouldn't give right now for a big juicy steak. Cows are sacred! Stewie, what do we do? That's Quick, hit the red buttons! It's sacred! It's sacredly delicious! <laughs> Now let's, let's get see out of what here. Their wieners look like. Yeah, yeah, no, let's get out of here. Mother. Seth MacFarlane is gonna get me in trouble, dude. Remember, he wrote these jokes, not me. Anyway, Brian eventually finds his girl, but he's in for a rude awakening the next day. You seem nervous. Are you worried about meeting Padma's family? Oh my, you both look so elegant. Family, guests, and monkeys who have wandered in to steal fruit welcome you to this engagement celebration. So who's getting married? I am. Padma, my beloved daughter. Diraj, my future son-in-law. Well, that's a Punjab to the figs. Where's the bar? But something happened today, and I can no longer marry you. My true love is here tonight. His oh. name is Brian Griffin. Uh -oh. Quick, everyone's looking at the dog. Go, go, go. Yep. What if I were to repay you for all you've spent? You would do that? Yes, no. I suppose that might be possible. Brian and Stewie offer medical procedures off the street to raise enough money, but when this terrible idea fails, Brian has a better idea in mind. Who wants to be a millionaire? Brian Griffin! Jiminy Cricket. D. Jiminy Cricket. Final answer. Oh. I'm sorry. That is incorrect. Padma, I'm sorry. I still haven't raised the money. My father has solved the problem by promising Dheeraj the hand of my younger sister. I think watching you try to answer that question out there, I realized something. You know nothing of my country or my culture. You and I have very little in common. I realize I do not want to marry you. I just did not want to marry Dheeraj. This sucked and you failed. Better luck next time, Brian. Also, just saying, this is definitely the weakest Road 2 episode. You can tell the writers liked the idea of the characters going to India, but didn't know what to do once the characters got there. Still funny as f**k though. In Roads to Vegas, Stewie uses his teleportation device for a trip to Vegas with Brian, but a glitch in the system causes the duo to get split into two different versions of themselves. One where Brian and Stewie have a great time, and one where the duo has a terrible trip. It's a cool plot, with the episode jumping back and forth between the two scenarios. For example, look at how the start of the trip goes for the first pair. Teleport to Vegas, huh? Alright, let's do it! Okay, now the device is powered by kinetic energy, so you've got to dance to make it work. You, uh... Really? Yeah, you've got to dance. <laughs> what, what are you doing, you tool? It, it worked. We're in Vegas. Yeah, all right. Well, let's hit the hospital, get checked for teleportation cancer, and then party. Stewie, that teleportation machine is amazing. It's so great that we're already here. Yep, drink it in, Bri. Time to enjoy all the Bellagio has to offer. Yo, Looks like a great time, the right? well, I cannot say the same for the second duo. 90% of the episode is them getting f over. It's really funny, but I also feel bad for them. Three hour delay and a completely full flight. Look at us, you pig. Take your juicy sweatpants and your dirty pillow from home and your bucket of coke and get the hell out of my sight. What was her problem? Oh, thank God we're finally here. That plane ride took forever. Hi, we're checking in, Griffin. Yes, and I'm afraid we have no other rooms available. Well, this sucks. Ah, damn it, Vegas! The second duo's luck does not improve as the episode progresses. Remember, the entire reason they traveled here was to see Celine Dion live. Well, that is not happening. I didn't realize how far that awful hotel is from the Strip. I'm sorry, these tickets are invalid. I can't let you in. You know what? Screw it. I, I say we just cut our losses and fly home. I may have gambled away our plane tickets. Did you fellas say you were in a bit of a fix? My buddy's got the inside track on a basketball game. It's a sure thing. What do you want from us? I'm trying to sell my condo, and I need people to come to the open house and talk about how nice it is. Well, in season six, episode eight, Peter suffers a stroke that paralyzes the left side of his body. Word? In this episode, Peter saves the owner of the fast food restaurant McBurger Town, but unfortunately loses his beloved mustache in the process, leaving him very no. sad. Body game. No! God bless you, sir. You saved my life, but at what cost? At what cost? <laughs> to show his gratitude, the owner gives Peter a lifetime supply of free burgers. Oh. Peter joyfully accepts, claiming this reward is far better than anything Helen Hunt could offer. You want to have sex? No. <laughs> no, 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 yes. no, no. Yes. I think that's a yes. No. To soothe the pain of maybe. losing his mustache, that's Peter devours maybe. 30 burgers Not on the first yes. day, stopping maybe. only when he loses feeling in the left side of his body. Come to think of it, I 
can't really feel anything. We gotta see what her non-cartoon really? self looks that like. That doesn't sound good. Peter, are you winking at me? Shit. Oh my God. At the hospital, Dr. Hartman diagnoses him with a stroke, resulting in complete paralysis of his left side. Peter, sweetheart, how do you feel? Uh... Had better days, Lois. Had better days. <laughs> After three months of caring for Peter, the entire Griffin family is exhausted and eager for his recovery, while Peter yeah, continues his bad habits. What the hell you think you're doing? I'm handing you a beer. You are handing it to my stroke arm. This is my good arm. Bring a beer over here. That's better. Despite being paralyzed, Peter attempts to drive, blasting It's the End of the World as we know it, and dancing to the music as if he were perfectly fine. However, he loses control of the car, crashes into a tree, and gets mocked for it. <laughs> stroke! Stroke! <laughs> stroke! Stop mocking me! Frustrated with his condition, Peter goes to McBurger Town to rant, vowing revenge for what the restaurant did to him and Wimpy. For what you did to me and what you did to Wimpy! I would gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. He wishes for a way to cure his paralysis and boom, guess what? He finds a cure in just five minutes. You heard that right, only five minutes and Peter is fully recovered. How long was I in there? About five minutes. Why are we not funding this? Back home, Peter plans to sue McBurger Town, believing they caused his stroke. Ridiculous, right? But that's Peter for you. Despite Lois's warnings that they are wealthy and he can't win, Peter is determined, armed with the help of a sly cat lawyer. I'll find a way. With the help of my snarky cat lawyer, Meowsy McDermott, that's, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> Been in court, even before the trial begins, the judge rules in favor of McBurger Town, as they have 100 lawyers defending them, while Peter tries to bribe the judge with a magazine he already owns. They have 100 lawyers, and you tried to bribe me with a subscription to Grape Soda Today, which I already have. Racism. Case dismissed. But the story doesn't end there. Peter insists that these people are villains and continues to pursue the case, claiming he's faced tougher challenges before, like the time he came up with ideas for Robin Williams. Okay, religion. Huh? Religion! You kill me, I kill you, we both go to heaven. <laughs> 72 virgins. Huh? You might have to help me out with the last 10 or so because Mr. Happy gets tired. Religion. Peter and Brian disguise themselves as Asian investors and visit McBurger Town's headquarters, demanding a tour. You don't look Asian. Well, I guess we'll just take our millions of dongs elsewhere. Wait, wait, let me get our general manager. When Brian asks Peter what he's planning, Peter reveals he's looking for evidence to bring down the company. The manager shows them around and introduces a new marketing mascot named Meaty, an easily angered clown. Hey kids, who likes McBurger Town burgers? I there was more to my question! <laughs> We're still ironing that one out. Finally, Peter's chance arrives. They discover a secret room, which turns out to be McBurger Town's slaughterhouse. Inside, a cow starts talking to them. But in here, we call it Dachau. Dachau? Dachau. Except we spell the cow part C-O-W, like cow. So it's kind of a... Uh, uh, sort of a dark joke. Sharing that many of his kind, including his wife, have been slaughtered there. With a sympathetic heart, Brian believes this is the evidence they need. They just need to get the cow out to testify. Peter agrees with Brian's plan, and chaos ensues as they are chased by the building security. <laughs> In the end, they escape, leading to significant damage to the McBurger Town chain after the cow rallies the entire town to boycott burgers and switch to salads. Say no to a fast food restaurant and eat a salad instead. To say, I will eat this salad with pride. I don't care if I look like a gay person. In season four, episode three, Peter goes blind from consuming too much nickel. Oh. Feeling down because all his friends have accomplished impressive feats, like Quagmire being honored by the mayor for saving lives, Joe receiving a medal for catching a thief, and even Cleveland once being a renowned auctioneer. I have 125, do I hear 130? 130,000 for this authentic Comanche headdress. I got 130, I got 130. Do I hear 135, 140, do I hear 140? Hey. Peter fears that if he dies tomorrow, no one will remember him. Cleveland jokes that if Peter jumps 
jumps off a skyscraper and lands on Joan Cusack, people will say, hey, remember that guy who landed on Joan Cusack? But Peter wants to be remembered for something more significant. He climbs onto the roof of the drunken clam and shouts that he will do something unforgettable, only to fall and crush Joan Cusack, setting off a series of comedic mishaps. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, oh God, sorry, sorry. Hey, Joan Cusack. Hello? Uh-oh. Determined to be That's remembered, Peter invents a new type of airplane and has Stewie pilot it. Despite Stewie's bad feeling, he follows Peter's instructions and predictably fails miserably. All right, Stewie, let her rip. <laughs> All right, we attack the Rice crispy guys at dawn, <laughs> assuming Judd Hirsch delivers the goods. Next, Peter dresses up as Gray the No Trash Cougar, a character he believes is adorable, to scare kids into properly disposing of their trash. Pick the trash! Oh. I want to know whose cup this is! Oh. I said I want to know whose cup this is! Pick it up! Pick it up! Pick it up! Pick it up! Oh. Pick it up. Thank you, sweetie. After a week of trying, Peter is disheartened and laments that he will never be remembered like his great uncle, the Siamese twins who fought each other in the Civil War. I'm seceding like hell you were! Right in the balls. Not too smart, huh? Yeah, did not think that one through. Finally, Peter comes up with a unique idea to eat more nickel than anyone ever has, hoping to become famous like the world's fattest twin. Did I tell you that I'm doing Atkins? Oh, that's not good for you. After consuming a massive amount of nickel coins, he tries to make sounds with them, but Meg hears nothing. Brian says it doesn't sound like Camp Town races, and Stewie calls it the worst use of currency since Peter bought that bicycle. Hey ladies, check out this ride, huh? Yeah! I'm off to make trouble for the establishment. The next morning, Peter wakes up blind. At the hospital, the doctor diagnoses him with nickel poisoning, leading to his loss of vision. Back home, Lois rallies everyone to help Peter because he is now blind. Meg feels it's unfair that no one cared when she lost her limbs and was nearly blind and mute. Hey, hey, Meg, they got a happy day spoof in here, but they call it crappy days. <laughs> uh, all right, you know what? If you're not going to laugh, then I'm not going to keep you company. Peter, feeling down, complains that now people will only remember him as a blind man. Brian encourages him not to give up, saying many blind people live rich and fulfilling lives. Peter immediately yeah. tried to move, but was pranked by Stewie and fell flat on his face. Oh. Life becomes more challenging for Peter. He mistakenly enters Chris's bedroom, thinking Chris is Lois, and later, he walks into Stewie's room. My hands on your big, soft boobs, uh. running down your big man like uh. Holy crap, it's Chris! Uh. You still awake, honey? What the deuce? Unable to do anything on his own, Peter buys a guide dog named Brutus. Feeling increasingly insecure, Peter believes this mistake is worse than when he lived with Superman. At the drunken clam, God flirts with women using lightning bolts, causing a fire. Oh, uh, let me light that for you, babe. Wow. Yeah, magic fingers. <laughs> Jesus Christ! What? Get the Escalade, we're out of here. Everyone scrambles to escape, but when Peter arrives, the bar is engulfed in flames and his dog refuses to enter. He ties the dog to what he thinks is a parking meter, but it's actually a homeless man's neck. All right, you don't want to come in? Fine, I'll just tie you to this parking meter. Inside, Peter asks Horace for a Pawtucket Patriot, oblivious to the heat and the fact that Horace is trapped under a beam. After listening to Peter's ramblings, Horace tells him to grab his hand and pull him out. Come on, let's go! Outside, firefighters are at work, and reporter Tom Tucker is ready to interview our hero, Peter Griffin. Tell us, sir, how did you summon the courage to save your friend from that burning building? That freaking place was on fire?! And there you have it. Coming up next, watch me shave. Lois and Brian feel proud of Peter for saving Horace, even if it was accidental. This act helps people remember Peter as a local hero. Moreover, he receives new eyes and a medal for his good deed. <laughs> In season nine, episode eight, Peter suffers from severe kidney failure. The story oh. begins with Peter feeling exhausted due to sleepless nights caused by Brian's disturbances. Hello? Hello? 
Are you a dog? Yes! I am also a dog. All right! Yeah! We're dogs! Yeah, we're dogs! We're dogs that live near each other! His close friends introduce him to Red Bull, a drink he had never tried before. The result? Peter feels instantly revitalized after trying it. However, after consuming too much Red Bull, Peter returns home bursting with energy. He punches through the door to get inside, damages the curtains, and flips the sofa where poor Meg is sitting. Oh, hey, 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 hey. Always up, flips the couch where poor, where poor Meg is sitting. Boring. Holy smoke, it's crowded in here. When Lois no asks where he's been, Peter replies that after downing a few cans of Red Bull, he drove to New York and back. Whoa, the power of Red Bull is incredible, isn't it? Peter then turns his attention to little Stewie, playing with him at max speed. Hey, here's my little man. <laughs> Witnessing Peter's super fast cereal eating, Chris also gets excited about Red Bull and asks Peter for a few cans. After breakfast, Peter goes to milk the cow, drinks another can of Red Bull, and speeds up the milking process process to the point where the cow's udder catches fire and it runs away. Oh. At that moment, Chris appears with his lower half on fire. Most people have to pay for oh, such oh a boy, thing. that Red Bull's some strong stuff. Yeah. Oh God, I don't remember that. Oh God, why? Oh. You know why that part is burning, right? I'm sure you're thinking the same as I am. Peter I'm joins not. The Price is Right and becomes the top the contestant. After drinking a can of Red Bull, Peter spins the wheel and greets everyone at home. His spinning force is like a superhero's, causing the wheel's gears to break and fly off, resulting in a catastrophic accident that injures the audience. Ooh. Whoa, paramedics, come on down! Oh. <laughs> At home, Lois decides oh, to throw yeah. away all of Peter's Red Bull because it makes him crazy and isn't good for him. Yeah. Another piece of evidence for this is when she pours Red Bull on a flower, causing it to grow large and be able to walk. And become racist. Uh, uh, oh, look at uh, one different flower? Different flower, oh. Uh, official flower business. Yeah. <laughs> GTA 5. Peter is furious about this and decides to create his own Red Bull using kerosene as the main ingredient. Crazy, right? Ignoring Brian's warning that this drink could kill him, Peter believes that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger no, and starts not, drinking not like the mixture. Dragon Ball Z. <sighs> See, Brian, now we don't drink. Feel great. Peter, Peter, are you alive? Oh, oh you're alive. Okay, I, I won't. Uh, I won't uh, eat you then. I was gonna eat you. At the hospital, Dr. Hartman concludes that after drinking a concoction of various toxic chemicals, Peter has suffered kidney failure, leaving the family in shock. Dr. Hartman puts Peter on the kidney transplant list, but he has to wait for a suitable donor. In the meantime, Peter must undergo dialysis three times a week. Dialysis? Damn. Is there any other way? Yes, there is. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. What's with the dialysis? After three weeks of dialysis, Yo! Peter feels Yo! disheartened, not knowing how long he can endure Yo! this. To cheer him up, Dr. Hartman lets him play with a postnatal <laughs> bucket. Is there any other way? Yes, there is. <laughs> Don't lock horns. Always locking horns. <gasps> that's, oh my God. that's too funny. While drinking beer with his friends, the TV announces Peter's favorite show, Charles in Charge. But he can't watch it due to his 3 p.m. dialysis session. Joe and Quagmire suggest skipping one dialysis session wouldn't hurt. Following their advice, Peter decides to stay and watch the entire show. And guess what? Missing his dialysis session causes his condition to worsen, turning his skin yellow. Oh my god, Peter, you don't look so good. What are you talking about? I feel great. Like I could go another 20 years or more. At the hospital, Lois is very worried because if Peter misses another dialysis session, he could be in grave danger. But Dr. Hartman can't do much as many others are also waiting for kidney donations. Unless the Griffin family finds a compatible donor for him. Lois is willing to donate her kidney to Peter. Whoa, Damn. what a wonderful wife. But unfortunately, she isn't compatible with her husband. Well, we always check spouse records for compatibility. I'm afraid you're not a match. But it turns out you are a match for a little girl who's dying in that next room over there. Ah, oh. oh, well, how about we concentrate on this family, Doctor? Just when things oh, seem oh, hopeless, like Brian says he's willing to donate his kidney. After testing, Dr. Hartman announces that they are compatible. What? No way. I mean, Brian is a dog. How can he be compatible with a human? 
Stay tuned to find out. The family is overjoyed to learn that Brian's kidney is compatible with Peter's. But Dr. Hartman reveals a problem. Brian's kidney is too small to replace a human kidney, so they would need to use both of Brian's kidneys, which means Brian would die. Despite this, Brian agrees to go through with it, saying that Peter is his best friend, the one who gave him a home when he was in trouble, and he wants to repay Peter by helping him live another 40 years. Not with a whole life, bruh. Like, nah, I couldn't, I couldn't even do that. Yeah. After all, I'm, I'm a dog. I have another eight years at best. I'm, I'm willing to give that up so you can have another 40. No, I'm good. The day before the surgery, Brian says his goodbyes, sharing heartfelt words with everyone. Stewie, who witnesses all of this, doesn't want to lose him and kidnaps Brian that night. Where, where am I? We're at the playground, Brian. I kidnapped you. You and I are going to spend the rest of our lives living right here under the slide. Dewey is too attached to Brian and doesn't want him to die for his fat dad. Brian advises Stewie that he can live without a dog, but not without a father. Reacting like a child about to lose his pet, Stewie starts crying helplessly. I love no, 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 just watch. No, oh, God, this Brian. Oh, oh, go, 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 go roll around in the sand like in, in the summer house. Go, go to the Please. summer house and roll around. <laughs> As the two prepare for surgery, Dr. Hartman announces that a donor has been found for Peter. It's him. Dr. Hartman also reveals that using a dog's kidney to replace a human's is impossible. I mean, I mean, dog kidneys? I mean, I'm not even sure dogs have kidneys. <laughs> what? Do dogs have kidneys? Yes. Ah, uh, this. This is the guy. And he had to do this because the Griffin family is his only patient. The episode ends on a happy note with both Peter and Brian safe and sound. Peter loses all his bones in season 3, episode 21. The Griffin family gathers to watch the newlywed game. Peter pops open a beer bottle and out comes a genie. Peter is stunned and honestly, so am I. A genie from a beer bottle? Unbelievable. The kids excitedly wish for new hats, but alas, the three wishes belong to Peter. His first wish to see what Kelly Ripa looks like off camera. Hey Kelly. Gelma needs us on stage for a couple of reshoots. Be right there, Reg. I just have to put on my face. His second wish, to have his own theme music, which he enjoys everywhere he goes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the bus, his theme music annoys a big guy who demands Peter turn it off. Peter, clueless on how to stop it, gets threatened with a bone crushing. Desperate, Peter uses his third wish, I wish I had no bones. Instantly, everyone flees in terror. I wish I had no bones. Done. Ah! That ought to show you. <laughs> ah! Oh no, I got a fart but I don't know which way to lean. Back home, Lois worries about Peter's mobility, but the kids love his new look. Chris plays with Peter's flab like it's slime, and Stewie marks his territory on Peter's body. Look, I'm making an angel. See, Lois, everything's gonna be fine. Now smile while I write my name in you. Oh. At the amusement park, hilarity ensues when Peter gets sucked into an elevator, but is unharmed due to his boneless state. Later, while playing with Chris and Meg, he gets flung into a nearby bathroom. Peter, now a dirty mess, needs 12 baths a day, much to Meg and Chris's annoyance. Lois encourages them to accept it, comparing their situation to a Dateline episode where families pretend to be happy while secretly feeling dead inside. I might have screwed up my life, but there's no reason I gotta keep screwing up theirs. Goodbye, cruel, bone-filled world! Yeah. ...up in Hollywood, where he becomes useful as a mattress. Ooh, ah! Cut and print. That's a wrap. Great job, Peter. He excels in his new role and gets invited to a party by a director at 8 p.m., where he catches the eye of Catherine Zeta-Jones Douglas, who has a thing for oddballs. I'm married to Catherine Zeta-Jones. Will you sleep with me? Oh, yeah, I I'm gonna have to pass. But the Louis Anderson's eating the decorative soaps in the bathroom. Why don't you try him? At the party, Peter meets a doctor who wants to try bone grafting on a jellyfish, but decides to experiment on Peter instead. And guess what? Peter agrees. Oh. After the surgery, Peter becomes a new kind of oddball, leveling up in weirdness. At least he can stand now, right? The twist, the bones grafted into him are from his own family. Surprise! My God, you mean it's your bones that are inside me? Well, mostly. We picked up a drifter to fill in the torso. Well, like I always 
always say, a family of freaks is better than no family at all. This episode shows us the unbreakable bond and endless love of family, proving we can do the unimaginable to help our loved ones. Peter loses his arms in season 19, episode 6. The Drunken Clam has upped its game with new services like karaoke and beer pong, making it the go-to spot for nightly fun. This influx of people has the guys feeling a bit miffed about losing their private hangout. But when they discover its magic night, their spirits lift. Peter gets invited by a magician to participate in a trick. I, I couldn't possibly. Can you do something Very else? Very well. Let's just say goodbye to these cards. Ah, put it oh. out! I have been the great Sebastian, and I bid you good day. The magician then leaves to grab a sandwich, forgetting his vest. Peter, finding comfort in the vest, decides to wear it. When Quagmire and Joe compliment how great it looks on him, Peter decides to keep it on for a while. After all, it's been ages since he turned heads with his catwalk skills and smooth curves. I'm all the boys. With the vest on, Peter feels like a washed up actor teaching drama in a city that's not New York or LA. All right, Shreveport Community Center, listen close, for I shall teach you the acting craft. Hey, didn't my husband chase you away from our recycling bin? Use that. Next, he imagines himself as a pianist performing in the Wild West, stubbornly playing a tune the cowboys hate because it kills their trash talking vibe. Where am I? You're a Westworld robot. You live in a computer-generated simulator. Yeah, I already don't care. He takes Chris to a Cherry Poppin' Daddy's concert, dancing with lonely white guys. Chain those pants and let's dance. While having fun, disaster strikes. Peter's arms get tangled in other people's chains. He tries to signal them to stop, but they're too engrossed in the performance. He starts losing feeling in his arms, Ooh. and boom, Peter loses his arm. Oh. Hi, I'm the lead singer of the Cherry Poppin' Daddies. My name doesn't matter. Please, don't wear wallet chains to our shows, otherwise you could end up with both arms ripped off like this guy. Tell them we're the band from Swingers. We're not the band from Swingers. We're not?! At the hospital, Dr. Hartman tries his best but can't reattach them. Don't worry, Peter, they'll grow back. He reassures. Oh my god! Don't worry, they'll grow back. Just spread the seeds on, keep them watered, and watch them grow. p p, -p peter when the bandages come off, Peter's arms are indeed growing back. It's bizarre, but hey, it's a cartoon. Anything can happen. As the family watches TV, Meg surprises everyone by bringing her boyfriend home. Peter immediately asks Lois for a private chat in Joe's kitchen. Why Joe's kitchen? Because Joe has better snacks. Lois wants to discuss Meg's boyfriend, but Peter is only interested in Joe's Cheez-Its, which Bonnie has hidden. I was eating a bunch of them, and I jokingly said, Bonnie, hide these. And she did. She hides my food so I don't get bored like a zoo polar bear. Good luck. They could be anywhere. Damn. Oh. Lois disapproves of Meg's choice because everyone knows the guy is gay. Peter soothes her with his tiny hand, saying the important thing is Meg's happiness. Is it really such a bad thing, Lois? I mean, they're having fun with each other. Speaking of having fun, what do you say you and I do a little of the old, uh... Huh? Peter goes swimming with his tiny hands, but the pool staff stops him. You know Peter loves a challenge, so he jumps in anyway. Unable to swim, he yells for help, fearing an old man might crash into him. I can only flap about like a motorized tub toy. Please help me, and hurry. I'm about to get hit by the old retired guy doing laps. Quick, he can't hear me because there's an investment commercial playing in his head. Lois advises Meg to reconsider her choice, leading to an argument. In the heat of the moment, Peter asks where the first aid kit is because he burned his head. Lois doesn't know since Peter took it to work to look successful. Hold the elevator, hold the elevator! Sorry. Can someone push any button, please? I don't work here, I'm just being silly. The episode continues with Meg's wedding plans, but I'll stop here. Don't miss the hilarious scenes with Peter's tiny hands. Come on, big money! Still 300. Uh, wow. How about T again? Uh. Peter's health takes a downturn in season 12, episode 15. Angela arrives to assign tasks to Peter and Stella, but just as she does, Stella steps out, leaving Peter fuming, thinking she's shirking her duties. Angela reassures him that Stella is just taking a smoke break. This marks the beginning of Peter's health decline as he picks up Stella's smoking habit. First, he has to convince his boss that he's a seasoned smoker. Clearly a 
smoker. Enjoy your break. Peter felt great using this as an excuse to avoid responsibilities and live on the edge, much like his great-grandfather, the King of Denmark, who enjoyed having many wives and very long tables, which ultimately led to a heart attack that doctors couldn't treat in time. Come here, hurry, run! But the very far away doctor couldn't make it in time, and that's why here in Denmark, we have very small tables. Very small tables. Peter's smoking habit becomes pervasive, even while listening to Meg's school stories or changing Stewie's diaper. Oh, oh, smoke break. Well, this is how Scott Kahn was raised, and he turned out okay. The funniest scene is when he sneaks a smoke break during intimate moments with Lois, which infuriates her. You know, Peter, it's so nice that after all these years we've been together, we can still- Smoke break! What? Peter, what are you doing down there? Nothing. Well, it doesn't seem like nothing. Oh! <laughs> the on fire! She urges him to quit before it's too late, but Peter dismissed her worries, believing that smoking a few cigarettes an hour wouldn't lead to addiction. But Peter, you're already addicted. Lois was worried about him, and to soothe her, he assured her that he could quit smoking any time by flicking his cigarette out the window. I'm so sorry I threw you out the window! <sighs> Hey man, can you keep it down? Sorry. Wait, whose bedroom are you in? Meg's. Okay, that's fine then. Peter becomes Whoa. unusually diligent, waking up early to sneak out for a smoke. He even uses fetching the newspaper as an excuse to light up. When he tries to step out again, Lois stops him, making him sit still, which leaves Peter restless and irritable. Oh, Peter, I meant to tell you, remember my cousin Sylvia's husband, Robert? Well, Does this story have an end? At the clam, Quagmire asks when Peter started smoking. Peter admits he initially used it to escape work, but found smoking enjoyable and beneficial, like ending awkward conversations with a flick of the ashtray. Your marriage is over. Well, now that you say it with the cigarette... The next morning, yeah. Peter wakes up looking haggard, scaring Lois into urging him to see a doctor. He refuses, so Lois tricks him into going. There are Cheez-Its in there. Cheez-Its? Huh? Wait, wait, what's going on? I'm scared! I'm scared! Oh, it's nighttime. Good night. Dr. Hartman is at a loss, as Peter's addiction has no cure. It's all up to Peter. Lois decides to send him to a rehab center. Seeing others in worse health at the center, Peter regrets his choices and wonders how to quit, wishing the cigarettes would quit him instead. Peter, I think we should see other people. Okay. Uh, good, that's what I was gonna say too. At the center, a man approaches Peter, inviting him to join their anti-smoking campaign, but with the odd condition that he must continue smoking to maintain his wrinkled appearance. There is one catch. If you're gonna be our spokesman, you have to keep smoking. We need you to stay wrinkled and sickly. Peter, excited by the prospect of being on TV, agrees. He becomes a celebrity, watching his TV moments with friends. Hi, Peter Griffin, sickly smoker. This is your heart. This is your heart on cigarettes. On a bed of Any cigarettes. questions? Yeah, where'd you get that heart? Uh, oh. Back home, Lois is annoyed by Peter's continued smoking and urges him to quit as his appearance deteriorates. Peter argues that looks don't matter since they don't need to see each other while sleeping. Okay, now put on yours. Wow, isn't it weird that we both picked Mario Lopez? Yes, Peter, it's very weird. Yeah, it shows that we both go Latino, but soft Latino. Peter's management company ends their contract with him. He begs to stay, but fails to meet the assistant's challenge. Touch your toes. Please give me something else. I'm sorry, Peter, it's over. He cries like a child over losing his favorite job, but Larry is there to comfort him. Why are your eyes crying, Peter? They fired me, Larry! Come on, let's go kidnap my neighbor's dog and tell them we don't have it. In Criss Cross, Chris is having a rough time at school after getting teased for his no-name sneakers. Desperate for cash, he spots some money in Lois's purse and decides to take it, but Meg catches him in the act. As we've covered in previous videos, Meg blackmails the crap out of Chris, making it so he has to do whatever she wants or else she'll snitch. But eventually, this just sends Chris into the arms of his true soulmate. 
Hi. Yeah. Do you mind if I live with you? My goodness. I feel like I'm gonna pinch myself to see if I'm dreaming. Don't give yourself a heart attack, old man. Did you see how excited this dude got? Later that night, though, is when things really get weird. It's six o'clock. I'm, I'm not really tired yet. You had those three cups of NyQuil. You'll be down soon enough. Sweet dreams, Chris. Mr. Herbert, what's life really all about? It's about trying new things. Thanks, Mr. Herbert. But don't you think it's scary to try new things? No, Chris. Life is like a new baseball glove. At first, you think you're never going to get a ball in there. But then you oil it up, work your fingers around in there a little, and pretty soon you're pitching and catching. Oh, boy. Is that what happened with Diddy? Sorry. You really know how to waste a Cialis, don't you? Or Real smooth, Chris. Pill. The next day... Herbert wakes up to find his house in total disarray. His beloved VHS collection is in shambles, with tapes scattered everywhere. Chris casually picks up a VHS Only labeled Lost video. Boys, which prompts Herbert to act very suspicious. What did you do with my videotapes? I was trying to find a good movie to watch. I've never even heard of most of these. Mikey's scoliosis exam? Nephew's somersault compilation? I assume you heard of the alphabet. You want to explain to me how Sammy Popsicle comes before napping various? Geez, I'm sorry. Well, can we watch Lost Boys? I've heard of that one. Those? Those are different Lost Boys. <gasps> that clip I just played could prematurely end my YouTube career faster than I oh, prematurely finish in bed, boys. but it was worth it for you guys. Anyways, things take a turn later in the episode when Herbert's finally fed up with Chris not living up to his expectations, so he kicks Chris out. From here, Chris leaves, only to reunite with Meg, and the two siblings make up after realizing they need each other. Meanwhile, Herbert watches from afar. Yeah, I forgive you. <laughs> we broke up. The show is so f***ing weird, man. The main plot of Absolutely Babulous revolves around Stewie burning down the house after realizing all his awards are just participation trophies, leaving the Griffins to move in with Lois's Stewie, parents. Meanwhile, Peter gets caught up in a bizarre bonding moment with Babs, leading to some family drama with Carter. There's a pie baking contest, a drunken night out, and even a near fight at a truck stop. But honestly, all of that isn't why we're here. Herbert pops up for a quick moment in this episode, his first appearance in a while at the time. When the Griffins house catches fire, Everyone manages to escape except Chris, and who comes swooping in to save the day? Chris is still in there! I wouldn't have did that at all. Thing, Instead of bringing Chris back to his family, Herbert just keeps running straight into his house. I'm sure a lot of Herbert's fantasies came true that night. To Love and Die in Dixie kicks off with Chris wanting to buy a gift for a girl from his school. But because he's a broke boy, he ends up getting a paperboy job. This must have been fate though, as this eventually leads to an encounter with a certain elderly neighbor. Oh, hey young fella. Come on over here, son. Mmm, that's a nice muscly throwing arm you got there. Got a nice tip for you right here in my pocket. Why don't you reach in there and fish never, it out never, never fish I don't a tip out of the, the end of the month. Month. Weird. Fun fact, this is Herbert's first ever appearance in Family Guy, and from the get-go, he is way too eager to befriend Chris. Chris eventually gets the gift for the girl and gives it to her, but of course, he messes everything up. Fast forward to the next day, and Chris runs into Herbert again. Hey, muscly arm, why the long face? Oh, it's this girl. Oh, uh, who needs them? You like popsicles? Well, sure. And you need to come on down to the cellar. No, thanks. I gotta get going. Don't make me beg now. You're funny. Bye. Get your fat ass back here. I feel messed up saying this considering the context, but that scene is actually pretty iconic. Everybody would mimic that popsicle line in Herbert's voice back in the day. Anyways... After this, the episode really heats up when Chris witnesses a robbery, but when the criminal escapes and threatens Chris, the FBI relocates the entire Griffin family to the Deep South for their safety. While there, Chris bonds with a new friend, Sam, and eventually realizes later that Sam is actually a girl. I know you're probably wondering what the fuck this has to do with Herbert, but just wait for it, trust me. In the end, the criminal manages to find Chris, but is eventually shot by Sam's father, thus sending the Griffins back home, and holy sh**. Look at what the Griffins come Holy home to. Shit is real. You have 113 new messages. Oh my. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, well, where the newspaper boy was. Guess who? Sorry to leave you so many messages. Just lonely here. Where are you? Oh, you starting to piss me off, you little pigless son of a bitch. Even in the middle of all this chaos, back home in Quahog, Herbert is absolutely tweaking over Chris. I've gotten these types of messages from dudes, and it's not good. 
But on the bright side, we've also got these type of messages from women. And those are good. <laughs> if that's not true love, then I don't know what true love is. As you just saw, Herbert really tried to get Chris's hands in his pockets in that last episode and failed miserably. But in Barely Legal, he actually gets what he wants. The best targets are old rich people. Go get them. Oh no, there's no police here to help me. I hope you don't find the money strapped to my thigh. In Barely Legal, Mayor Adam West deploys the entire Quahog Police Department to Cartagena, Colombia, leaving the entire city extremely low on cops. And of course, Peter takes advantage of this. Hey Lois, can you run inside and give me some oranges or whatever it is these things eat? What is that? This would be a giraffe, Isaac Newton. What would Mayor West send in all the cops away? Everybody can do whatever they want. You can't just break the law. You enjoyed that sh way too much, old man. In the episode, Play It Again, Brian, Peter and Lois are dealing with some relationship drama, so they head off to Martha's Vineyard with Brian for a vacation. Now, with Peter being the clueless husband he is, guess who he and Lois leave in charge of the kids? So it would only be till Monday and we could pay you for it. You, you've spent time watching children, right? Uh, yes sir, yes I have. You mind stopping by tomorrow morning? Oh, we're my snazziest duds. Got my tweed press, got my vest, vest all I need. Now is the boy, all I really need. While Peter's off getting wasted and ruining Brian's big moment while on vacation, Herbert is back home laying down the law with Meg, Chris, and Stewie. All right, children, want to lay down a few ground rules. No cussing, clean your plates, and only a half hour of radio, and then it's off to bed. Well, that sucks. And don't you mouth off to me or I'm going to slap you right in your penis. But I'm a 17-year-old girl and I don't need you here. But you're a 17-year-old girl and I don't need you here. Next, Herbert schemes to get Chris to take a bath, but his plan backfires in the best way possible. It's bath day. Oh, I don't want to take a bath. Not for you, silly. It's bath day for me. Know anybody with a pair of strong young hands to help me in and out of the tub? No. Oh, rats. As the night goes on, Herbert takes it upon himself to read Chris a little bedtime story. But Chris, at this point, has had enough and finally calls Herbert out. And he knew that sometimes the things that seem the most dangerous turn out to be the most fun. Are you a- Chris is very blunt and YouTube would literally spirit bomb my entire channel if I played the clip. But let's just say that we all know what Herbert is and Chris calls him it to his face. To wrap things up, Herbert's still hanging around Chris's bed later that night when the evil monkey pops out of the closet. <laughs> Yep, Talk about bad parenting, man. While Peter and Lois are getting into a love triangle with their dog, Herbert is back home reading bedtime stories to their kids. The episode Con Eris starts with Stewie discovering Brian's new hustle, dating rich, older women. While everything with Brian and Stewie is going on, Lois asks Peter to mow the lawn. Of course though, Peter, being Peter, pawns the job off onto Chris. Okay, Chris, now if you're gonna learn how to mow a lawn, the first lesson is that you always start by 7 a.m. For the rest, you can just watch this how-to video on YouTube. What's going on, guys? I'm Corey. Did you know Corey got recruited by ISIS? Ah, uh, salam alaikum, guys. This is Corey. Here to talk about making a dirty bomb with stuff you can find in your kitchen. Great Caesar's ghost. It's like in my dream. You know, I've been looking for a muscly arm young fella to mow my lawn. But I don't even want to mow this lawn. $3, Would $600 a week change your mind? Yes. You got a deal. Herbert, always looking for a reason to get Chris over to his house, desperately offers $600 to hire them to mow his lawn. And let's just say things get weird fast when Peter and Chris show up the next day. Hey there, Chris. You're big for your age, ain't you, Petey? Yeah. Doctor says I eat too much candy. Why, what's this? <gasps> wow, how'd you do that? It wasn't a trick, it was stuck to your neck. Oh yeah, sometimes I fall asleep on candy. While Chris and Peter are busy mowing Herbert's lawn and hilariously dumping all the grass waste onto Joe's yard, Herbert brings out cookies and juice, but this only results in Chris feeling a little jealous. Sweet! But Mr. Herbert, you always made the cookies with the large pill in the center for me. I thought I was your favorite. Ew. That's a real dark joke, hinting at Herbert's history of doing, well, questionable things. Later that day though, Chris absolutely snaps when he overhears Herbert and Peter playing horsey. Katie, <laughs> let's play horsey. What the hell? 
It's time you did all the work and I goof off with Mr. Herbert. What are you, what are you doing? What are we doing? No! No! Yes. Is this really happening? Now, how does Herbert react to this shocking news? I ain't the one going down. You're going down. No way. I'm going to pound your ass. No. You're seeming kind of cocky, and I hate cocky. Boo, no. cocky. No. No. Why are you being such a jerk, Dad? D -d 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 Dad? Yeah, this is my dad. Uh... Oh. Well, What's he that, often bro? said he wanted to explode all over me. So Weird. While this episode may primarily be about Stewie and Brian, Herbert really steals the show with his obsession over Chris and Peter. I can't believe I just complimented this creep, but anyways. Next episode. In LASIK Instinct, Lois accidentally hits Stewie's playmate, Doug, with her car and ends up needing hey. LASIK surgery. Unfortunately, hey. the surgery leaves her temporarily blind, which spirals into her starting a whole marketing campaign about her experience. Meanwhile, the children? Griffins volunteer to build Doug a treehouse to avoid a lawsuit, children, but baby. things get out of hand fast when Doug keeps adding on extra activity activities to spend more time with them. But the real eyebrow raiser in this episode, Doug casually mentions that he has a friend in common with Chris. We have a friend in common, Mr. Herbert. We're friends. Uh, sometimes he comes to my art shows and we get ice cream after. He takes you to the park where the swings go really high? He does! Uh-huh, that'll stop. I've seen a thousand of you. I've outlasted them. I'll outlast you. Now, given what we know about Herbert's past behavior, it's more than concerning that he's hanging out with Doug, a literal kindergartner. While Herbert's only mentioned briefly in this episode, the reference is enough to remind us just how weird and unsettling his character is. In German Guy, the Griffin family starts worrying about Chris's personal amusement habits, because that's totally not awkward. His little habit of uh, personal amusement is getting way out of hand. I mean, look at this. What's that? Some kind of board? It's Chris's blanket. <laughs> I'm pretty sure our washing machine is pregnant. Maybe you guys should help find Chris a hobby. Hey, Chris, get in here. We are going to find you a hobby. What do you think of that? Okay. There you go. That's the spirit. Yep. Peter Everybody decides to pregnant. help Chris find a hobby, and while they're out, they run into Herbert. Hey, Christopher. What you up to? My dad's uh, helping me find a hobby. Chris, don't Everybody waste our pregnant. time with the elderly. They're oh, dying. Oh. Please, God, let me just sniff his hat. I will throw up everywhere. Now I want more. Chris gets left on his own and ends up befriending a puppeteer named Franz. But Herbert quickly recognizes Franz for who he really is, a former Herbert? German soldier. When Herbert tries to warn Chris, Chris doesn't believe him. Where are you going? I'm going to Mr. Gutentag's house. His name isn't Gutentag. It's Schlicknacht, and he's a Nazi. He's my friend. I'm trying to help you. Help me what? Clean your pool with my shirt off? Or wash your car in jean shorts? I know what you're about, Mr. Herbert. Free labor, and I'm not into it. You have to choose. It's either Franz or me. Eventually, things escalate when Chris realizes that Herbert is right, but it's too late and Franz locks both Chris and Peter in the basement. All right, let's figure a way to get out of here. <gasps> oh my God, Mr. Herbert. Oh, he can't hear me. Jesse. Mm -hmm. Jesse, what is it, boy? Chris. You were right, Mr. Herbert. All my life, I wanted to see you locked in a basement, but now that it's happened, all I want to do is get you out. I'll be back with help. Here's where things get wild. Herbert suits up to confront Franz, and while going through his closet, we see him cycle through outfits, a jester suit, a bunny suit, and finally his World War II army uniform. But hold up, what? So, does this mean Herbert's a furry? Ew, maybe that's his true number one psycho moment right there. But the fight itself is priceless. Franz pulls off his sweater vest to reveal a full Nazi uniform, and the two old men engage in the slowest, most geriatric battle of all time. It's okay, we're fighting. Wake up. Oh, hang on, hang on, pills. Yeah, me too. Motherfucker! Would you mind calling my nurse? Her name is Frida. Her phone number is in the kitchen. 
after all is said and done, Herbert saves Chris and Peter, and the episode ends with Chris thanking Herbert and giving him a hug. Ah, oh, touching, right? Except for the fact that Herbert was literally foaming at the mouth, begging to sniff Chris's hat earlier, and has a suspicious bunny suit in his closet. There are definitely worse Herbert moments coming up, but this is all still very questionable. Chris is pretty dumb when it comes to Herbert, but how about Stewie? We find this out in the episode Moving Out. In this episode, Peter really screws Brian over while he's hanging out with Brian's girlfriend, Jillian. You know, you are a catch, young lady. You know that? I don't know when the hell Brian is going to open his eyes and get serious with you. Never. I really wish he would. Never. It'd be so great if we were at least living together. No. Well, no. you need to just lay no. it on the line with him. Either he commits to you or you're gone. Or you get the hell what out. What the hell did you do? Get her the hell There's out. only one problem. Brian cannot afford to live with Jillian. But don't worry. Stewie bails his ass out, all while also giving us another creepy Herbert moment. So how's it going? It's going great. I can't afford the rent. Sounds like you need a roommate. I picked up Chris's paper route. Gosh, gosh, bagosh, it's a brand new paper boy. Piss off, you perverted old freak. We got a fighter. He doesn't say much, but we already know where this is going. And it's even worse since Stewie is younger than Chris. In the courtship of Stewie's father, Peter's annoyed that he never gets employee of the month at work. No matter how hard he tries, it always goes to his co-worker, Opie. After some terrible advice from Joe about kissing up to his boss, Peter throws a surprise cockfight in her house. Spoiler alert, it doesn't go well. Meanwhile, the real action happens in the B-plot with Chris and, of course, Herbert. <laughs> Ah, crap. Well, looks like the good Lord just sent me a conversation starter. Herbert sees this as the perfect opportunity to get closer to Chris. And when Herbert visits the Griffins to snitch on Chris, Lois isn't too happy about paying for the damages. But Herbert, with his usual ulterior motives, suggests that Chris work off the debt by doing chores for him. Oh my God, I am so sorry. Chris, this is going to come out of your allowance. Oh. I could use a strapping young man to do some chores around my house. You have damaged this man's property. And until you pay off the debt, you'll do whatever job he wants you to do. And at the end of the day, if you're exhausted and your face is dripping wet, well, that just means you did a good job. That sounds fine. You need a strapping young man to help around the house? No red flags there, right? The next day, no, Chris begrudgingly starts flag, working yeah. at Herbert's place, and Herbert, as always, has to make sh** weird. While Chris is raking leaves, Herbert can't help but make his usual creepy comments. You know, if you get sweaty and want to take your shirt off, that'd be just fine. Or tie it in a knot, your choice. Later, Herbert takes Chris out to dinner, and the two snap a photo together. No. Trims of grass between our frozen dinners and our bedtime 9:15. We snuggle watching Lucy. I know a couple of dudes personally who did this. I don't even think they was in the dudes, man. Free the homies, man. I'm not gonna say their names, but free the homies, bro. <laughs> <laughs> On a big, enormous 12-inch screen Someday I know We too will go Somewhere that's green Are you dead? As you just saw, Herbert starts fantasizing about a life where Chris is his hardworking husband and he's the trophy wife. We get a full-blown musical number with Herbert dressed as a woman, imagining an entire life with Chris, including kids and all. The whole thing is styled like a 60s or 70s sitcom. It's psychotic, but it's Herbert, so no surprises there. After Chris finishes his chores and heads home, the episode ends with Herbert sitting in his living room and we get one last dark joke before the episode wraps up. I guess we gotta find some other way to spend our evening. Evenings. Back to ESPN coverage of the Little League World Series. Jackpot! While Peter's busy fighting off Disney villains and trying to bond with Stewie, Herbert's obsession with Chris reaches new heights in this episode. From getting Chris to work off his debt to imagining himself as Chris's wife, Herbert never disappoints in finding new ways to be deeply unsettling. Anyways, thanks so much for watching. 10 episodes where Cleveland Brown was a psycho. The episode Chris has got a date starts off with a pretty normal situation. Lois mentioning that she needs to take care of a certain squirrel that's been stealing tomatoes from her garden. But then we get a shot of Cleveland outside with Rallo dressed as a squirrel. What the f 
Peter, I need you to take Chris and Meg to school. Today's the day I finally kill that squirrel. Try to get like eight of them this time. I want to make bruschetta. Oh, can't the kids just walk? You know I like to watch two full movies before I go to work. You better That's keep real. those goggles, because I'm going to put them to good use tonight. Once the floor is full of sawdust, we can eat peanuts in here. Man, now I want some bruschetta. To be fair, is this the worst thing Cleveland's done? Sure, it's not as extreme as Peter blowing up a school or Quagmire's Holder Downer 5000, but involving your child in a petty crime, it's definitely weird and a little psychotic. The rest of the episode follows Chris trying to get a date for the homecoming dance, leading to a brief romance with Taylor Swift. But the main takeaway here is Cleveland's bizarre f tomato heist. In Love Actually, Cleveland turns into a total Chad, but man, does he also come off as a total snake to Brian. The story kicks off with Brian dating Carolyn, an atheist, and taking things slow thanks to Stewie's advice. But after weeks of no moves, Brian finally decides to go for it. Rose in hand, he heads to Carolyn's place. Oh my god! Carolyn? Cleveland? Oh hey Brian, close that window, you're letting all the stank out. Cleveland, you're sleeping with my girlfriend? I'm not his girlfriend. Well, you never made a move on me, so I thought you just wanted to be friends. Then I met Cleveland and things just kind of took off. Cleveland's just getting started though. He explains they met at Starbucks, flexes on Brian, and even tells him to hop on his gay bike. I just figured if I showed a little restraint, you'd respect me. I do. Now, why don't you go hop on that gay bike of yours and go get yourself a lollipop or a cupcake or something? <laughs> <laughs> we good, Brian. We good. Who is this man? I guess Loretta turned our guy into a f***ing king. But it doesn't stop there. Everywhere Brian goes, he keeps running into Cleveland and Carolyn in person and eventually even on TV. The dude just cannot escape them. Okay, look, next time we'll go to another store. How about that? Ball three low and outside to Ramirez. Wait a minute. What's this? There appears to be an interracial couple making love on second base. The crowd's enjoying it, and it looks like the umpire's gonna let him finish. Ow! Oh, and boom goes the dynamite. This would be painful to watch if you love that girl. Things come to a head when Cleveland shows up at the Griffin's house just to rub it in Brian's face that he's going to marry Carolyn. Brian, may I speak with you? Oh, Cleveland. I didn't recognize you without my girlfriend wrapped around your waist. She and I are both to a point of great soreness, so we took a break. Listen, I just want to clear any bad feelings you may have about me and Carolyn. <sighs> I guess it's okay. These are passing flings, nothing to get upset about. Good, because we're going to elope in Hawaii tomorrow night. What? You got a problem with that, you can go f*** yourself. Cleveland's confidence in this episode is unreal, dude. In the end, Cleveland gets a bit of karma when he catches Carolyn cheating on him with Quagmire. Guess it runs in the friend group. But somehow, Brian and Cleveland stay friends, bonding over the fact they've both been cheated on by the same woman. Plus, Cleveland might have gotten a genital wart from Carolyn. Nice. I wonder if he got that shit sorted out before meeting Donna. Dr. C and the Women is one of those episodes where Cleveland shows us exactly why he's not the guy to rely on when it comes to loyalty, especially when it comes to his own wife. In this episode, Cleveland finds himself in the role of a therapist after helping Joe and Quagmire settle an argument. And honestly, he's not half bad. He even starts helping out some characters like Mayor West and a guy with father issues. Mayor West, I believe you are affecting your weird behaviors. You are doing deliberately odd things to mask dark, maybe even criminal activities. I think you're a dangerous sociopath. You're absolutely right. Well, time to put on my spaghetti hat. I just never feel happy. This is a problem that requires more tweed. Is it possible you're not letting yourself be happy? Like you don't feel like you're worth it? Maybe your accomplishments don't feel real because your brother isn't here to see them. Maybe. You don't want to outshine your father. Oh my God. I was damn near out of tweed. While Cleveland may seem like a stand-up guy in this episode, things take a turn when he starts giving advice to Lois and siding with her over Peter, his best friend. I mean, come on, Cleveland. What about the f bro code, dude? Here they are. Get all of us squawking out, Doc? I think we got to the root of the problem. Absolutely. The problem is you. What? You're supposed to be my friend. Yeah, Peter was expecting Cleveland to take his side, but instead, Cleveland threw him under the bus, leading to Peter being forced to do laundry and spend quality time with Lois. Definitely not what Peter had in mind. Fed up with Cleveland, Peter comes up with a plan to blackmail him. And what does Peter use as leverage? Screw Cleveland. I'm gonna tell his wife a few things. Well, remember how Cleveland banged that stripper at his bachelor party? Maybe I could tell Donna about that. Cleveland, it ain't cool what you've been telling Lois. And you gotta tell her you were wrong and put things back the way they were. Personal growth isn't always easy. If you don't change what you're saying, we're gonna tell Donna you slept with that stripper at your bachelor party. Ah! 
Oh, no, no, Turns out Cleveland isn't just bad at sticking to the bro code. He's also been cheating on his wife. By the end of the episode, Cleveland admits that his job as a therapist just reminds him how much of a failure he feels like. But honestly, dude, cheating on Donna, siding with Lois, that's where Cleveland really messed up. And this isn't the last time Cleveland's going to pull something shady like this. Stay tuned because this man cheats again in a future episode. Next up is the daddy daughter dinner dance. While this video focuses on family guy moments, this episode from the Cleveland show is too wild not to include. I'm going right back to family guy after this though don't worry anyways the story starts off with cleveland trying to bond with his stepdaughter roberta by asking her to the annual father-daughter dance but it really hits the fan when cleveland f***s up any chance of rollo accepting him by doing this what i'm so sorry metalark lemon why'd you kill the dog wouldn't stop barking huh it was an accident since there's no sign of sexual abuse I'll go ahead and get rid of it for you. Kendra, hope you're in the mood for Chinese food. I told you, dude, this show is actually funny as f sometimes. Now, killing the dog was a dumb mistake, but the really messed up part comes afterward. Cleveland lies to his family, especially to Rollo, who has no idea what happened to his pet. Ah! Metalog Lemon never came back last night. We gotta go look for him. But let's remember that dogs are wild animals and have only been domesticated since, like, 7000 BC or something. Better go help him find the dog. I'll go shopping with Roberta. Metalog Lemon! Metalog Lemon! Metalog Lemon! If we don't find him, I'm gonna start using drugs, probably. You're all right, old Brown, because you're helping this man at a time in his life when he... Go ahead and blow your nose on my shirt if you need to. You know what's psychotic? Letting your stepchild search for a dog you damn well know is dead. Cleveland commits to this lie so hard that he has to do a bunch of nasty, gross sh just to keep Rollo convinced. <sighs> nothing, not nothing, but no dog. Well, not no dog, but no Metalock Lemon. He's not here either. This place smells like Chloe Sevigny. Who's that? Just some gross indie porno actress. You'd think this dude would just be honest now, right? Nope. It's not until Cleveland's friends roast him at the bar that Cleveland finally fesses up. So all day I was searching for a dog that I know is dead. Tell him it was delicious. What? Tasted a lot like kitten. Jesus would say you have to confess everything. Be brutally honest. Don't leave out any details. But I just broke through with these kids. I'm not sure how to tell y'all this, so I'm just gonna say it. Metalock Lemon was killed. What happened? As I was backing out of the driveway, I accidentally drove over his head with both my left rear tire and then my left front tire. I stepped out of my vehicle and saw his mangled, lifeless body on the driveway in a smeared pool of his own blood. I had no idea that in the hours that followed, Lester and his family would eat Metalark Lemon. Cleveland's confession is overly descriptive and detailed, even telling Rollo that Lester ate the dog. Unsurprisingly, this does not go over well. I mean, what did this dumbass expect? Cleveland tries to make it up by getting a new dog, but this also fails miserably. I got a surprise for you. I'd like to introduce you all to our new dog, Kareem Abdul-Jabark. <laughs> you can't just replace my dog like Brad Pitt replaced Jennifer Aniston. My dog is not Jennifer Aniston. Well, I guess it's just you and me, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. The episode ends on a somewhat happy note with Cleveland bonding with Roberta at the dance. But let's not forget, Cleveland killed the dog, let his neighbor eat it, and made his kid search for it like a psycho. Anyways, back to Family Guy. I may sneak another The Cleveland Show episode in, but if I do, I promise it will be a good one. When Lois gets a copy of Trisha Takanawa's book to declutter the house and throw it away, she gets a little too inspired, leading to the entire family being kicked out one by one. Peter ends up in a storage facility and eventually the rest of the family joins him when Lois declares they no longer bring her joy. As the Griffins try to figure out what's going on, they discover Lois has left to Mount Asia to find answers about life. And before they take off to find her, they catch Cleveland and Joe doing some weird sh Are you in my kitchen? No. What are you doing? Nothing. Hey, bud. Not a good time, bud. Well, she's dead. It's a suicide note. Maybe she just took off somewhere. I'll call Cleveland. Maybe he saw something. Hello? Are you stealing my carpet plumbing? No. Hey, Donna. Did you check the counter for cure rigs? Not a good time, Don. I mean, who does that? Your best friend's family is in crisis, and your first thought is to rob them of their plumbing? Honestly, Joe should probably arrest him for this, but Joe's too busy raiding the Griffin's fridge himself. It's funny as f but what a dick. 
A shot in the dark starts with an innocent enough situation, Peter and the guys forming a community watch after their couch gets stolen. Things take a serious turn though, when Who Peter spots what he thinks is a criminal breaking into Cleveland's house. It's dark, the figure isn't responding, and Peter, thinking he's protecting his friend's home, f***ed up big time. Hey you! Hold it right there! I'm warning you! Cleveland Junior? I'm sorry, sir. No visitors. Excuse me. I'll have you know I'm the shooter. How's he doing? How's he doing? How do you think he's doing? You shot my son. On accident? Now, it's totally Maybe. understandable that Cleveland would be upset. Who wouldn't be? His son got shot. But where things go off the rails is when Cleveland takes the whole situation and turns it into a hate crime accusation. You wouldn't have fired that gun if he was white. That's not true. Yeah, I'll shoot anybody. Let's all just calm down. I want this racist out the room and I want him arrested. Yes, Peter shot Cleveland Jr., but there's no reason to make this about race. Even Cleveland Jr. admits that he didn't hear Peter because he had headphones on. But instead of focusing on the fact that Peter accidentally shot his son, Cleveland blows things way out of proportion and convinces the town that Peter is a racist. To be fair, Peter doesn't help himself when he tries to fix things. Look at this idiot's first idea. What are you doing? Lois, I am going to go to the middle of the town square, get naked, and paint myself brown. No, no, that's offensive. What? It's a stupid idea! You're a stupid man! A stupid, stupid man! Oh, you're hurting me! Stop it! Stop oh. it, Lois! And why do you always announce them to me before you do them? Are you trying to get a rise out of me? Peter's next idea isn't necessarily a bad one, but of course he finds a way to mess it up. It's time we bury the hatchet. Now let's just have a drink and put this all behind us. We can smoke them together, all happy, like a bunch of douchebags outside a wedding. Get out of here! Oh, come on, this'll change your mind. Oh my god, quick, do something! <laughs> Get your family out of that house! See, kids, I told you we'd make friends here. As things escalate, Peter ends up arrested and the situation goes to court. Carter's lawyer attacks Cleveland Jr., trying to paint him as a thug, and the town believes it. Now the tables have turned and it's the Cleveland Brown household that is hated. But in the end, they sort their shit out when Peter gives a speech. Cleveland finally admits that Peter shot Jr. out of stupidity, not racism. Get out of here! My son didn't do anything wrong! Listen, Cleveland Jr. doesn't deserve any of this. He didn't do anything to me. I just got scared and I did something stupid. I did shoot him. I deserve to be held responsible for my actions. Wait a minute. Peter didn't shoot my son. I did. Peter was just taking the blame for me. He's a good friend. I, Cleveland Brown, a black man, shot Cleveland Brown Jr., another black man. <laughs> Where did everybody go? You want to make the media go away? Just mention black on black crime. Listen, I know you wouldn't have shot Cleveland Jr. on account of his race. You shot him because you're stupid. You took responsibility. That's what's important. You forgive me? Of course I do. Mr. Griffin, just so you know, I'm gonna be coming for your ass. Cleveland takes things to a whole new level of scummy behavior. While volunteering at a homeless shelter, Cleveland notices that the residents are eating better food than he gets at home. And instead Ooh. of being a decent person, what does Cleveland do? Mm, I'm so hungry I could eat a sandwich meant for a peasant. Ah, hand pain! They're for the homeless. Is that wow! Cleveland, you haven't touched your food. I can't eat this. Not after what I saw at the sandwich buffet. I mean, shelter. Yeah, that's right. Cleveland isn't starving. He just likes the sandwiches. So much so that he's willing to lie to Donna and everyone else, saying he's volunteering at the shelter when really he's scamming the people who actually need help. But it doesn't stop there. Sandwiches are not enough for our boy Cleveland. This dude takes full advantage of the shelter, spinning ridiculous lies about his situation, taking free toys from a toy drive meant for homeless kids, and even accepting free health care. Time for hobo initiation. Take whatever you want. It's free. Wow. I feel like a kid in a used candy store. I'll be homeless for Christmas. Come with the Stealing toys for my two boys and girl. Back 
eventually, Cleveland's con catches up to him when he's nominated as a special angel for the homeless, thanks to Donna. His lies are literally exposed on live TV, and Cleveland becomes hated throughout town. But instead of a sincere apology, Cleveland has to go and say a bunch of dumb shit. But I can publicly apologize for my actions. What I did at the shelter was wrong. It was low down, like a midget. <gasps> and while trying to apologize for my actions, I insulted little people. It was worse than interracial marriage. Without interracial couples, we wouldn't have Halle Berry. I'm not some drunk Indian on the res. If you Native Americans had even the most basic system of ownership, None of this would have happened. By the end of the episode, Cleveland tries to make things right, and this time, his apology actually lands. He points out that everyone ignores the homeless after the holidays, which finally earns him some redemption. But let's not forget what Cleveland did here. He literally pretended to be homeless to get free food. And not just food, he stole toys for homeless kids, and even took a $10,000 check meant for the shelter. Taking advantage of the less fortunate just because you like their sandwiches? This f is crazy. The Book of Joe centers around Joe trying to publish a children's book, with Peter eventually taking over as the face of the project. But before all of that happens, we get a hilarious moment from Cleveland. Look at Cleveland over there. He's obviously cleaning his feet in the pool without making it look like he's cleaning his feet in the pool. That's a good temp. I wonder if this temp is the same on my other foot. Sure is a good day for it. Good day for these wet paintbrushes too. Is the pool too warm for paintbrushes? This isn't the worst thing Cleveland has done, but it's definitely inconsiderate and a little psychotic. Definitely one of the reasons why he's been, he got thrown off the show. He would never be invited back. Our next episode, Ladies Night, gives us a glimpse into just how far Cleveland is willing to go. While it starts off with Cleveland drinking and having a good time with his buddies, Donna is less than thrilled. After she rejects Cleveland's advances, things take a weird turn when Cleveland pulls out a blow-up doll to, well, handle things himself. That sure was a fun party. Hmm. No, Cleveland. I'm just tired. Cause I'm going to sleep. Fine. <gasps> Good night, madam. Oh, hello, madam. I need to get myself one of those. Maybe I can find one that looks like Meg? Now you'd think that's as strange as it gets, but no. Cleveland doesn't just use the blow-up doll, he has a full-on conversation with it over dinner. So now, Donna will be friends with my friend's wives. Oh, so you're not going to leave her? I never said I was gonna leave her. Rollo. You are having a dream. But things get really messed up later in the episode. After Donna lies and sneaks out to have a girl's night and reconnect with her old friends, Cleveland stumbles upon her and exposes that she is married and not single. The only reason these girls are even hanging out with Donna is because they think she is also a single mother. When her friends find out she's married, Donna lies to keep up the act. Instead of Cleveland confronting her normally, he decides to take the weirdest route possible. He dresses up as a pimp, brings along two escorts, and treats Donna like crap in front of her friends. Here I am with my my two favorite hoes. Uh-oh. Cleveland? My wife, what are you doing here? What are you doing? I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm leaving you high and dry, you stupid female. As a matter of fact, all of y'all are stupid. Now, the idea here is that this gives Donna an excuse to dump Cleveland, but here's where Cleveland takes it too far. Turns out, Cleveland isn't just pretending to be a pimp. He actually plans to sleep with the escorts, telling Donna, don't worry, I'll use a condom. What a loving thing to do for your wife. So romantic. This next episode, He's Black, brings Cleveland back to Family Guy. And while the jokes about the Cleveland show's failure are hilarious, Cleveland's behavior takes a darker turn in this episode. After moving back into his old house, Cleveland's friend group helps fix the place up, but things get weird when Quagmire meets Roberta for the first Whatever you do, never threaten to bone a different girl to the girl you're talking to. Never. First time. This house is a disastrous area. Well, we'll all have to do our part. I'll take little cocoa butter here. <laughs> Why is Cleveland just letting this shit happen? I mean, this is Quagmire, right? So we all know what's going to happen next. Remember what happened with Meg? And yet, Cleveland, knowing full well Quagmire's history, doesn't stop him. That's some seriously bad parenting right there. The moment where Cleveland really crosses the line comes when Peter gets the idea to foster an abused eagle to help their wives bond. Cleveland, one thing that always bonds women is healing an abused animal. So I got us an injured bald eagle. This particular eagle is a dick. You need to release that eagle out into what that eagle say lock the door 
I mean, where the hell did that come from? Cleveland always seems so calm, but then he completely flips. This is one of the few times in Family Guy where Cleveland actually is a bit of a psycho. It's funny, but also super messed up. In the end, Cleveland and Peter work through their issues and their wives make peace. But let In season 17, episode 19 of Family Guy, Meg ends up with diabetes and it all starts when she and her family attend a streaming convention. Peter, being his usual self, goes wild with antics like taking selfies on hospital bed. Don't really want to get into it, but I'm fine. <laughs> oh boy, well this is the last thing I wanted. He then live streams on Instagram and picks a fight with a gangster, resulting in an arm injury. <laughs> but luckily, oh. Peter manages to escape. Oh. I got away! Hey guys, I'm in an Uber heading back to Screaming Con. Uh, man bun alert. <laughs> Back at the convention, Peter challenges Corey to make Meg an internet celebrity. Corey immediately helps Meg become famous on Twitter with the nickname Fridgebod Meg. Oh my god, Dad, I'm trending on Twitter! Once home, Peter assists Meg in building her personal brand by filming videos for her. However, this father-daughter duo isn't exactly a match made in heaven, and Peter gets scared, leaving Meg to fend for herself. Meg, fueled by her passion, continues to film videos on her own. This time she invites everyone to tour her fridge and eat everything inside, from yogurt to raw meat. Oh this might God. not be Meg's smartest decision, but it sure makes the audience laugh when she ends up spending hours on the toilet due to digestive issues. Sponsored by Oscar Mayer and Lando Lakes. If it's not Lando Lakes, it's not cream! <laughs> During this ordeal, she snaps a hilarious photo promoting a toilet paper brand, gaining even more followers on Twitter. Meg quickly lands various advertising deals, including one for Magic Shell Topping. In a hilarious twist, Peter uses the topping to turn himself into Han Solo, but then another Peter shows up and the two argue over who the real Peter is. I mean, come on, a topping can't beat the real oh. deal, right? And Lois just ends up killing an ice cream, right? Damn. Thank God, Lois. Does anyone mind if I turn the thermostat down to 32 degrees? But none of that matters because it helps Meg become even more famous, though she's also gaining weight from all the sugar. Meg, now famous with the hashtag HashFridgeBodMeg, continues her journey. She grabs what looks like seven liters of corn syrup and, cheered on by her fans, drinks it all and passes out. Luckily, Brian shows up in a Hummer, I borrowed it from the garage while they fixed my girly car, oh. and rushes Meg to the hospital. On the way, Brian notices Meg's middle finger smells funny. Her middle finger smells weird! Do you know what it smells like? Comment know. below. Oh, just know. kidding, keep it to yourself. At the hospital, Dr. Hartman diagnoses Meg with type 2 diabetes. Her blood is like sap in Vermont gold. After waking up, Meg becomes the face of the diabetes medication Panresta, and things go downhill from there as she uses Panresta as a painkiller. Pencresta makes opiates look like baby aspirin. What? Oh. Lois warns Meg that the medication doesn't work and could lead to blindness and losing her legs. But of course, Meg doesn't care. Her diabetes worsens and she can only lie in bed because her legs have complications and she can't walk. Yet her endless passion for fame drives her to continue filming eating videos from her bed, really? featuring sugary and starchy foods. Her neighbor Joe senses something's wrong with Meg's legs. He has a knack for connecting with people who've lost their legs. Meg's feet are gone. Rotted. I have a gift for knowing when something bad happens to someone's legs. Kind of like a shiny. Indeed, her legs have become necrotic. Now in a wheelchair, Meg attends a rally in her honor at school. There she meets her friends who have become obese from following her sugary and starchy diet. If anyone remembered what we looked like, it would be shocking how fat we are. You've inspired us to gain all this weight, and we just wanted to say thanks. Oh no! At this moment, Meg realizes her mistake. She looks out at the hall filled with thousands of obese fans waiting for her. She feels scared and blames herself for making everyone overweight. After calming down, Meg decides to warn everyone about the dangers of unhealthy eating. This enrages her fans yeah, who stomp their off. feet and demand the return of the old fridge bod yeah. Bring back the fridge! Bring back the fridge! With the combined weight of thousands of obese fans stomping, a horrifying scene unfolds as the hall collapses, crushing an old janitor, leaving only his legs visible. From that point on, things get better. Meg gets new legs and returns to her normal life. Sure. 
Good news all around. In season 7, episode 11, Meg gets the mumps thanks to her dad, Peter Griffin. The story unfolds when the Griffin family attends a Star Trek convention. Meg complains to Peter that it's super boring, but Peter is thrilled and eager to explore new things, starting with LeVar Burton's glasses. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> is that Why really, would he wear these? Is that really what Who he saw? invent these for him? Meg's nightmare begins really when Peter saw, spots though? a guy in an awesome costume with an alien-like face and immediately wants Meg to take a picture with him. Meg tries to refuse, but you know she can't say no to Peter, right? I mean, After the photo, the guy reveals that he has the mumps, not a mask, which freaks out the family. Hey, how'd you make that awesome mask? It's not a mask. I have the mumps. What? You came to a Star Trek convention with the mumps? But it's too late. Meg catches the mumps because she wasn't vaccinated, all thanks to Peter's ignorance. Poor Meg gets teased by Chris and Stewie for her swollen face. Meanwhile, Peter, terrified of catching the mumps, brings a TV to Meg's room while wearing a hazmat suit with a long breathing tube, thinking he'll be safe. I would be but very no. Terrified Stewie pranks him by filling the tube with toxic no. gas, causing Peter to choke and vomit violently. Well, Peter totally deserved that, didn't he? Feeling bored, Meg watches religious shows featuring Kirk Cameron, no. which give her a newfound faith in life, especially feeling more loved by God than by her dad, Peter. Your mother made soup for you. Here you go, honey. Well, you know who does love you? The Lord. Here's your milk. After five days bedridden, Meg bounces downstairs full of energy, much to Lois's delight and Peter's surprise. Peter, shocked that Meg is still alive, jokes that she'll need a college fund and tells Chris to sell their performing camel, Humpy, to raise money for her. Meg believes that God healed her and feels reborn. She shares with everyone that she was bathed in the blood of the lamb and had everything about God explained to her by Kirk Cameron. She becomes the most devout believer in the family, ready to forgive all the terrible things Peter has done to her by letting him say grace before meals. Dear Lord, please give me the cheat codes for Mike Tyson's punch out. I have been stuck on Bald Bull for four years. I tried left, left, up, beat, dodge, uppercut, but he still knocks me out. Seeing Meg go overboard, Lois advises her to tone it down, but Meg ignores her and turns her attention to Brian, discovering that he's an atheist. This shocks the family, but they understand Brian has his reasons. I mean, look at the Hubble telescope. It's discovered untold wonders of a vast, unexplored universe, but not one picture of a guy with a beard sitting around on a cloud. Meg gifts Brian a cross, hoping he'll open his heart to God, but Brian treats it like a toy. Undeterred, Meg invites Kirk Cameron's brother, Growing Pains, to talk to Brian about God. But it seems Meg and this guy have a deal. They got my picture up at the drugstore and they won't sell me any Sudafed. I'll make it worth your while. Ben! Dad! Ben! What have I told you about trading sexual favors for Sudafed? Brian gets annoyed with Meg's attempts to change him, and despite her explanations, he remains an atheist dog. So Meg does something bad. She tells everyone Brian is an atheist. The news spreads quickly, and Brian is mentioned on the evening news. Angry at Meg, Brian reassures himself that everything will be fine. But no, people start coming to the house and throwing things to protest Brian. Oh. I thought only he without sin could cast the first Prius. <laughs> it doesn't stop there. Brian is denied city services, and worst of all, no bar will serve him drinks. This led to a hilarious situation where Brian asked Chris to pretend to be an adult to buy alcohol for him. However, this plan failed because, well, you know, Chris doesn't have an ID that says he's of legal age. How Brian, frustrated by his lack of booze, starts hallucinating bottles spinning around his head. Come on, you know you want to drink. Yeah, come on, Brian, drink us. Come on, drink me. What are you waiting for? Yeah, you big silly ass. Just wrap your lips around me and take a big gulp. Despite being mad at Meg, he pretends to be enlightened and starts <laughs> believing in God just to get his drinks back, making Meg hug him with joy. Brian tells Meg to spread the news so he can return to normal life. To celebrate, Brian suggests they drink like Jesus did. Do you like the wine? Very much. What is it? Take a guess. I have to leave. Oh. 
Nah, sit down. Meg wants Brian to join Work in a Bill book Cosby. burning, believing these books could harm God. Brian refuses and admits he lied about being enlightened just to drink. He advises Meg to wake up because book burning is wrong. She doesn't listen until Brian's persuasive words finally make her see reason. If there were a God, would he have put you here on Earth with a flat chest and a fat ass? And what kind of god would put you in a house where no one respects or cares about you, not even enough to get you a damn mumps shot? Meg acknowledges Brian is right, but wonders, if not God, what should she believe in? Brian's answer, believe in yourself, Meg. Meg suffered from septic shock in season 12, episode 4. Curious to know why? Let me tell you the story. Meg went to school as usual, opened her locker, and found her baby calling her mama. She immediately threw a book to crush him. Poor kid. When Meg's friends showed up, she turned into a different person, more friendly. She was surprised when they called her Megan and explained that Meg was short for something fun. She really died boning hot dogs? Damn. I would say uh, there's probably worse ways to go, but we gonna edit that out. Near. But actually, Meg is short for something else. Peta, would you give this to the nurse? Uh-huh. <laughs> Robots in disguise. Meg's peaceful days were about to end with the arrival of Mike Pulaski, a tall, bullying student. The atmosphere at school became tense. Neil had a brilliant idea to make peace with the bully by befriending him. Whoa, great idea, but it turned Neil into a balloon in Mike's hands. <laughs> Damn. Awesome. At what? lunchtime, Meg and her friends were so engrossed in their conversation that Meg accidentally bumped into Mike, spilling food on his shirt. Terrified, she apologized immediately. Mike coldly asked her name, and her brother Chris eagerly answered for her. Meg Griffin! Mike told Meg oh. he would deal with her at 3 p.m. on Friday. Meg started planning for the fight, first by reclaiming her back skin from Chris. Ew, what was Chris doing with Meg's back skin? Do you know? Yeah, back at school, Principal Shepard announced yuck. the betting rules for Meg Griffin's fight on Friday, making Meg even more scared and clueless about what to do. Her friends advised her to find a way out of the fight. Meg went home and told her mom she wanted to transfer schools, suggesting Carlisle Academy, which led the state in pregnant students, hoping to meet someone. Mom, please. There's other schools. Pregnant. Carlisle Academy leads the state in teen pregnancies, so... I might meet somebody. Really, Meg, but Lois definitely said no. Meg came up with a crazy idea to upload a video of her playing with frozen sausages online, hoping it would go viral and get her expelled. Unfortunately, her plan failed as the video got only one view from her brother Stewie. <gasps> oh. You know what? Good for her. Not giving up, she paid $1,000 to hire four big guys to help her beat Mike. But the result was disastrous. What's going on? Did that kid from the future come back? <gasps> oh! Damn, you're next, Meg. Oh, no! Meg was terrified by the scene. She tried everything but to no avail. She even imagined her own funeral. Thanks, didn't want to pay for the whole... Meg's close friends, fearing they might get involved, abandoned her. Feeling desperate, Meg cried a lot, but just then her savior appeared, Quagmire. Wait, why is Quagmire in the girl's bathroom at a high school? Because it's his base for a mission. This is my base of operations. Uh, Mr. Quagmire, the girl's gym class will be in the showers in 20 minutes. Thank you, Shirley. She's been with me 12 years. It's her birthday today. Didn't get her anything. Seeing Meg in big trouble, Quagmire decided to help, promising to train her to defeat Mike. Quagmire shared that he made a mistake in high school by not standing up to his bully, and that's why he would do his best to help Meg overcome this ordeal. Quagmire taught Meg to channel her anger by wearing a mask of Peter and signaling her to punch it hard. This led to a funny situation where Joe and Dr. Hartman mistook Quagmire for Peter. I don't know, he's just so needy, and uh, I feel like he's jealous of our friendship. Hey, Peter. Hey, Joe. I'm glad you guys are here. I've got terrible, gross medical news for Quagmire. Maybe you can help me break it to him. Back to training, Quagmire advised Meg to use her most powerful weapon, her disgusting body. To get in shape for the fight, he made Meg drink raw eggs, but she wondered why there were no yolks. I don't see any yolks. Just drink it. Do you know why there were no yolks? I bet you do, right? The much-anticipated battle between Mike and Meg arrived. Everyone predicted Meg would lose, even thinking about attending her funeral. Hey, who are you taking to Meg's funeral? I'm taking Jill. Mm -hmm. 
wise guy were going as friends. She asked Mike not to hit her chest as it was a sensitive area, but Mike wasn't one to talk. He punched Meg, grabbed her by the neck, and kept hitting her face, making her look Damn. both beautiful and ugly. Oh. 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 Just stop there! Oh. Punch Rocky Dennis! It's okay, guys. I'm at peace with what I'm all about. Quagmire reminded her to use her disgustingness. She started counterattacking with a kiss, which stunned Mike and made him miss his punches. Meg quickly followed up with an acne no! attack, causing her opponent to vomit on the spot. She finished with a display of her disgusting body, making Mike melt in agony. Yes, she won, but one year later, her body reacted to a frozen sausage, leading to septic shock and death. A year later, my body reacted to a frozen hot dog, and I died of septic shock. I became the public face of internal hot dog defrosting. In season 11, episode 12 of Family Guy, Meg loses a kidney. Yes, you heard that right. She loses one of her kidneys to a handsome organ trafficker. The story unfolds on Valentine's Day when Meg connects with a charming guy named Toby online. Excited, she agrees to go on a date with him. When they first meet, Meg compliments Toby, saying he looks just like his picture, but he jokes that she doesn't. What? Yeah, that's a candid from a summer job I had. Toby then reassures her that she looks even better in person. Before leaving the house, Meg tells Brian and Stewie not to wait up for her, implying she'll be spending the night with Toby. Don't wait up, boys. Meg feels great as they share common interests, like their love for Coldplay. As they toast to their wonderful date, boom, Meg is drugged by this bad boy. So what should we do next? When she wakes up in a motel, she is horrified to find a surgical scar on her side and asks Toby what happened. He casually replies that he harvested her kidney. What surprises me is that Meg isn't angry about losing her kidney. She's upset about the size and the scar of the incision. Toby explains that it was his first time doing this, so she should cut him some slack. Only then does Meg get truly angry about losing her kidney. Toby apologizes and reveals that this job makes him a lot of money. As he tries to leave, Meg stops him and insists he fulfill his promise to spend the entire Valentine's Day with her. Faced with Meg's determination, Toby agrees. During their time together, we learn that Meg had a conjoined twin sister who died after being separated from her. By the way, did you know you had a tiny conjoined twin attached to your hip? Is it worth anything? It is to me, I've been using it as a bookmark. With her wound still bleeding, Meg and the organ trafficker enjoy a fun day together, oh, eating boy. ice cream, ice skating, and drawing caricatures. Got ice skating. Definitely gotta draw caricatures. At the end of the day, Toby takes Meg home and, before leaving, gives her a gift. Guess what it is? Toby. Ooh, it's Meg's kidney, but Meg's reaction is what shocks me the most. She happily accepts it and says it's the best Valentine's Day ever, and they kiss. Chilling, isn't it? Meg suffers from hemorrhoids in season 18, episode 18. When she arrives at school, she finds out that classes are canceled, but no one bothered to inform her. Returning home, she finds the house empty. Calling Lois to ask where everyone is, she is shocked when Lois and Peter pretend not to know her, claiming the real Meg is with them. In reality, it's just a dummy they set up to avoid celebrating poor Meg's birthday. Oh. Feeling down, Meg heads to the bowling alley for some distraction, but the place is just as dreary. On TV, there's news of a severe car accident with one fatality. Joe rushes to the Griffin house to deliver the tragic news that Meg was the victim and her body was burned beyond recognition, oh. leaving only her driver's license for identification. Peter is confused because Meg is right there, thinking Joe was joking Very until a strong confused. gust of wind blew the hat off the wooden dummy, revealing the truth. You know, it's weird that didn't happen on the pier all day. Or when we rented that convertible. Back at the bowling alley, Meg discovers that Bruh mistakenly gave her driver's license to another girl, leading everyone to believe she was dead. And the saddest yeah. part? No one seemed to care. But wait, there's a silver lining. Quiznos cared enough to light a bunch of lanterns for her. Quiznos, eat fresh. I hope. Eat fresh. At Meg's Maybe. memorial service, almost no one showed up and no one offered condolences to her family. Witnessing this, Meg became furious and declared she would leave town to start a new life. But she accidentally opened the wrong door, angering the priest. 
Oh, Ooh, sorry. Don't you know what a rosary on a doorknob means? In the pouring rain, Meg mean? asked Siri to play Kiss from a Rose by Seal, then laid flowers on her own grave. <laughs> she moved into a new apartment, which she repaired and decorated herself. There, she made new friends under the name Natalie Hallway. They invited her to a welcome party on the rooftop, but she couldn't sit on a chair without a cushion due to her hemorrhoids. To Natalie Hallway, our new friend. Natalie, sit down. Tell us about yourself. No! What a view! At school, after Meg's death, Chris became popular and received many privileges, like using the driver's ed car whenever he wanted. Meg wanted to forget her past in Quahog, so she constantly lied to her new friends, claiming she had lived at the U.S. Embassy in South Korea or was one of the first black women to study math for NASA, making them exclaim, your mom must be so proud of you. Just then, Lois posted a tribute to Meg's childhood, making her miss her family. She said that she was that her mom was the first black woman to do something? Missing this one today, her baby teeth never came in, so we got her dentures. She called Chris, hoping he would help her return home. Chris was surprised to see Meg alive. Alive? After learning that Meg wanted to come home, Chris surprised her by pushing her into a truck. Meg's death had made him popular at school, and he didn't want her to ruin everything he had. However, Chris soon faced some consequences for his action. You're good to go. All right. <laughs> yeah, what are you doing? Sorry, I got distracted by all this whap on the side of the van business. Meg was locked in an abandoned warehouse, and no one could hear her cries, but she could still listen to her favorite music. Siri, play Seals and Croft. Done. Meanwhile, at Meg's school, a memorial service was being held with her entire family present. I'm gonna need three seats for my elbow supporters. Refusing to accept her fate, Meg used all her strength to bash her head against the floor, creating a pool of blood to slide out. As everyone enjoyed the memorial, Meg burst through the doors, declaring she was alive, shocking the entire hall. Lois was overjoyed and asked what had happened. Meg pointed at Chris, saying he had done this, causing the principal to misunderstand and think Chris had saved Meg, signaling everyone to celebrate. Hey, I'm not gonna make it this weekend. Janitor dance. This is our last chance to get laid before janitor college. You think I don't know that? Meg immediately no. corrected him, saying, Chris kidnapped me to keep his popularity. But with his newfound fame, Chris stubbornly acted as if Meg were still dead. Surprisingly, everyone chose to believe him, even with Meg standing right in front of them. It was sad for Meg, but she found some comfort when Lois hugged her. Yeah, Meg, I'm just really glad this whole ordeal is over. Glad this whole ordeal is what? Over. <laughs> Back home, she apologized to her mom for faking her death. Lois reassured her, saying women can fake many things, like death, orgasms, or being impressed with their husband's achievements. Meg has sensitive eyes in season 11, episode 13. It all starts with Chris, who is ridiculed by his classmates during math class for wearing ugly, brandless shoes. This makes high school even harder for him, reminding him of last year's equally yeah, bad experience when he when tried to lose school. weight just to wear a cool baseball cap. Hey guys, sure hope we win the big game on Saturday. Get lost, dork. Yeah, gain some weight, will ya? <laughs> <laughs> oh, of all the years to be trim and well-hatted. Not gonna make the joke I was about to make. Not this time. Back home, Chris asks his mom for money to buy cooler shoes, but Lois refuses because the family is trying to save money. Peter even takes on an extra job as a vacuum cleaner salesman to boost the family's income. This thing can pick up anything. Here's a little demonstration. I'll pour some wine, rub in some feces, and to top it off, some mustard mixed with feces. Tough stain, right? Oh crap, I forgot the vacuum. Desperate to avoid wearing the ugly shoes, Chris sneaks into his parents' bedroom to steal money. The turning point of the episode occurs when Meg catches him in the act. With a confident look, Meg tells Chris she saw him steal money from mom's purse and that if he wants her to keep it a secret, he must do everything she wants. Chris has no choice but to agree. When Meg hands him a long list of tasks, he realizes his mistake but can't turn back. Screw Poor Chris man. does everything Meg wants, from cleaning her room to doing her homework, but Meg is Never still not enough. satisfied. She wants Chris to watch An Officer and a Gentleman and read a script she gives him when Richard Gere carries Deborah Winger out of the paper mill at the end of the movie. Movie. <laughs> That's gonna be you someday, Meg. I know it will. I just know it will. 
Meg's challenges for Chris become increasingly difficult. This time, she wants Chris to put contact lenses in her eyes, warning him, my eyes are very sensitive, they might overreact. Indeed, the process is tough. When Chris tries to insert the lenses, Meg's pupils move, scaring him, and Meg loses her vision, creating a chaotic and humorous situation. You look like one of those blind jazz guys! Where are you? I can't see anything! Ah! Thinking it's all over, Chris is shocked when Meg continues to demand more. She makes him stand outside the pregnancy clinic for 36 hours straight, taking pictures of all the girls from their class who enter. Chris completes the last task on Meg's list, but she has no intention of letting him go. Even though he looks exhausted, Meg keeps threatening Chris and forcing him to do things he doesn't want to do. Finally, Chris rebels, declaring he won't be Meg's slave anymore. The siblings have a fierce argument, and Chris decides to run away from home. Unable to endure his evil sister any longer, he runs straight to their neighbor Herbert's house, asking to stay over, making Herbert think he's dreaming. Live with me? My goodness, I feel like I'm gonna pinch myself to see if I'm dreaming. Hot dog, it's real! That night, Herbert takes a Kyalis pill and tries to approach Chris's bed, but everything seems fine until Chris farts, scaring Herbert away. Sorry. You really know how to waste a Cialis, do don't you? Do, man. The next morning, Chris angers Herbert by messing up all the videotapes he had meticulously organized. Chris explains he was looking for a good movie to watch, but only found strange titles like Compilation of Boys Tumbling. Finally, he finds a familiar title, but Herbert doesn't let him watch it. Well, can we watch Lost Boys? I've heard of that one. Those? Those are different Lost Boys. Meg starts to worry and searches for Chris everywhere, but can't find him. Chris's messy and lazy lifestyle makes Herbert very uncomfortable. Chris is addicted to video games and hardly cares about cleaning the house or Herbert's feelings. When Herbert complains, Chris responds disrespectfully, leading Herbert to kick him out. I think it's time for you to go. Okay, I'll go. But I want you to know, I faked all my lightheadedness. Mmm, good Kool-Aid. Whoa, whoa. Sound familiar? Meg is overjoyed when she finds Chris. She apologizes for blackmailing him and begs him to come home. Feeling Meg's sincerity, Chris forgives her and they leave together, yeah, leaving Herbert joke. in sadness. <laughs> we broke up! In season 11, episode 7, Meg has a heart on her head. Sounds ridiculous, right? But you'll see it's true in this episode. Meg is a boy crazy girl, especially for handsome ones. At school, she has a crush on a good looking guy named Kent, but she doesn't dare to ask him out because she thinks she's not pretty enough. So she only dreams about him. She's choking. Should we wake her up? No, she's got to learn to breathe out of her nose. Her dream continues when she sees Kent at the sports field. This time, she imagines Kent as a Prince Charming, riding a horse with her. Romantic, isn't it? But it makes her lose focus. And Have you ever started talking to a girl and she starts daydreaming while doing questionable things with her mouth on a hot dog? You better marry that one and she almost gets hit by Mayor West's car. She runs over to ask if the mayor is okay. He says she's lucky because this is his destination. Then he climbs a tree to incubate eggs. And the job exchange begins. Sir, do you want to move ahead on the agreement with the sanitation union? Sir, we need leadership. After this, Meg decides she will ask Kent out no matter what, but she doesn't have the courage to call him. Maybe she's afraid he'll reject her. She tells Lois that she has a crush on a guy at school and doesn't know if she should call him. Lois replies that if it were her, she wouldn't do it, but Meg isn't her, so she should decide for herself. Taking a yes, deep breath, would. Meg decides to call Kent, but he doesn't recognize her until she hints at the Facebook campaign. It's Meg, from English class? Uh... And math class? And bio? in the Facebook campaign to get me to kill myself? Oh, Meg! Hey, what's up? Meg gathers all her courage to ask Kent out, and to her surprise, he agrees, making Meg feel relieved and overjoyed. Kent comes to pick Meg up for their date. While waiting for Meg to shave, he chats with Chris. From his behavior, Lois sees that Kent is a good person, while Peter posts a new tweet. Daughter going on a date, is there a slow down button on this life thingy? In the cinema, Meg sees people around her getting cozy, and she wants to do the same with Kent, but he rejects her. 
Meg continues to send signals by saying she's cold, even though sweat is dripping down her shirt. She says this because she wants to hug Kent, but he remains indifferent and even leaves her alone to watch the movie. Oh. And now, our feature presentation, Adrian Brody doing sit-ups in 3D. One. Ah! Two. Ah! When Kent takes Meg home, she wants him to be her boyfriend and kiss her goodbye, but Kent rejects her and confesses that he's gay. Even more surprising, Kent says he likes Meg's brother, leading to a funny misunderstanding where Stewie thinks Kent has feelings for him and brags to Rupert. Ew. After learning the truth, Meg cries a lot, scaring the family and making them avoid her. Only Brian is stuck and has to talk to her. Meg feels hopeful after hearing his encouraging words. Maybe he thought he was straight, but then realized he's gay. He's probably still figuring things out. Hang in there. Well, I'll help him figure things out. I'll help him figure out that he's straight. Ugh, that was really close. While Kent was flirting with Chris at school, Meg came over and pulled him aside for a private conversation. She told him that she had a feeling he wasn't really gay, despite Kent's insistence that he was. Meg didn't believe him because of the way he talked and acted, like playing sports, wearing jeans that cost no more than $20, and using the word hello appropriately. Kent denied everything Meg said, and during this conversation, Meg revealed that she had a serious medical condition where her heart was located in her head. It's a serious medical condition. Yeah, that's, that's not supposed to be there, so she should probably always wear a hat. Undeterred, Meg continued to pursue Kent by showing him a picture of her hairy back and inviting him to hook up. This time, Meg went too far, making Kent angry and unwilling to be friends with her. I, I, I can't be your boyfriend. In fact, I don't even think I can be your friend. Her close friends asked what had happened, and Meg told them that Kent didn't like her, but liked Chris instead. Her friends were shocked, but encouraged her, saying there were plenty of sweet guys out there. However, Meg was too infatuated with Kent. She couldn't stop thinking about him, and every time she did, the heart in her head would beat wildly. She wished she could sleep with Kent just once to see what it would be like. Hearing this, her friend suggested, if Kent hooks up with Chris, you could ask Chris to describe it to you in detail. Awakened by her friend's words, Meg began planning to make Chris sleep with Kent. She wanted to use the free hug coupon Chris had given her on her ninth birthday, but upgrade it to a butt hug coupon for Kent. Hearing this, Chris told Meg she was crazy and that he would never do it because he only liked girls. Meg tried to persuade Chris by offering him $100, but this only made him more uncomfortable. I said no, Meg! I'll pay you 100 bucks! Oh, fine. I'll keep it in my bum. There'll be plenty of room. That's my sarcastic way of saying it's not gonna happen. Good day, Meg. Meg approached Quagmire to ask for a packet of sedatives to drug Chris. Before she left, Quagmire wished her luck and told her to call him if she got caught. That's what it's all about, Glenn. Don't rape it back, rape it forward. Continuing with her plan, she met with Kent and lied, saying that Chris wanted to hook up with him, but warned Kent that the kid will pretend to be asleep during the act. Whoa, what a great sister. She spiked the Kool-Aid with the sedatives and called Chris, finding him in her room. There, he showed Meg a picture of them as kids on a family trip to remind her of the good times. Feeling guilty about her plan, Meg poured the Kool-Aid onto a plant, which then attacked another plant after it passed out. Hey, so can I have some of that Kool-Aid now? No. No, actually, you can't. When Kent sneaked into Chris's bedroom, he found that Chris didn't want to sleep with him and called Meg to explain. She was forced to reveal her plan. Well, like I said, I, I changed my mind. I, I didn't do it, but um, I was kind of gonna roofie you. As Kent stomped out, he brushed uh -oh. past Stewie, leaving him disappointed. But Stewie's bad luck say. didn't end there. He mistook the sedatives for candy, ate one, passed out, and was approached by the plant. Uh -oh. What's this? Ooh, candy! Yep. The next day, Brian comforted Meg by telling her she just needed to wait for some guy to make a mistake. Meanwhile, Stewie complained that he might have poison ivy on his butt. Hey, do either of you know what poison ivy looks like? In Season 5, Episode 15, Meg is unable to speak or move after using a certain substance. Meg, what happened to you? She can't answer you. She can't even talk. Ever since she started smoking pot, she just kind of lays there. It's really sad. In Season 12, Episode 8, we see Meg getting bitten by a snake, which causes her entire body to swell. Oh. 
In season four, so Peter and the gang are on the hunt for a new fourth friend ever since that sellout left for his own show. He'll be back. They always come back. Anyways, Brian offers his services to fill that void, but Peter breaks the whole quagmire thing down for him. What quagmire thing? Oh, you know, just that he hates you. Quagmire hates me? Hates you. Well, geez, thanks for putting it so delicately, Peter. I don't get it. Why, why wouldn't Quagmire like me? Because he thinks you're annoying. You know, I'm sure a lot of people in town hate Brian, but like, at least Quagmire was chill enough to keep it to himself. Best not to poke the bear, Brian. Well, technically Quagmire's 50 pounds soaking wet, but I'm getting off topic. But Brian wants to make things right, so he goes to Quagmire's to have a little chat. Never do that. Hey, Quagmire, what a coincidence. You and me Never just running into each other. How, how you doing? What a coincidence. Like, you probably haven't been standing out there an hour waiting for him. But oh, hey, look, Quagmire has a girl over. And from the looks of it, she likes it rough. That's my sister, Brian. Her boyfriend has been beating her mercilessly. Oh yeah, I thought she looked familiar. Brenda makes another appearance in a very dark episode, which you can check out in this video here. I got a deaf brother, you wanna make fun of him too? Give him some time, I'm sure he'll think of something. And to top off this terrible interaction, Brenda's boyfriend arrives and makes this whole thing a lot more awkward. He's savagely beating her again, you hear that? Yeah, I'm not deaf. Oh, oh what, like my brother? Oh, there it is, see, I told you. But Brian isn't giving up yet, hatching a plan to win over Quagmire with a nice dinner. How'd you convince him to go? I tricked him, sent him a phony card. He thinks he's going on a date with an old girlfriend. Oh yeah, I'm sure he'll love that. It's like when you ask for a new console at Christmas and you excitedly open up your- But that won't be the last time Brian angers Quagmire, as Brian gets a bit too close with Quagmire's dad in, well, Quagmire's dad. So Quagmire's having a little crisis about his father, Dan. You see, Dan is known to be quite the womanizer, but Peter begins to suspect that Dan might be gay. It's great to see you back in your element tonight, surrounded by semen. <laughs> semen. Not entirely sure why Quagmire would have such an issue with it. He always seems to be a pretty open-minded guy when it comes to bedroom shenanigans. But after he hears some accounts from Dan's fellow sailors, his suspicions start to get the better of him. Your dad once drank me under the table. If there was one man you wanted in your hole, it was your dad. Your dad had the best business in the military. I tried Googling how that last pertained to the military, but all I got were some very questionable pictures. Oh no, I forgot to wipe my search history. Hoping to set the record straight, Quagmire confronts his father. Are you gay? Yeah, this seems like the kind of conversation to have in front of dozens of people. Son, you have my word, I am not gay. Well, that solves that. Nothing to question now. I sure hope nothing can sideswipe me before I finish this sent- But I am a woman trapped in a man's body. And while I'm in Quahog, I plan to have a sex change operation. I, well, I, I guess he's technically not lying about not being gay. So Dan goes through with the procedure and after a few hours, he walks out a brand new gal named Ida. What do you think, boys? I think this is about to create a lot of trouble for a certain dog. But where is Brian? Well, it, it turns out Brian just got back I into town after it. a seminar, so he has no idea what's going on. One thing that hasn't changed, though, Brian is still an alcoholic. Drop me off at the Marriott, I could use a drink. Yeah, so Brian's chilling at the bar and just so happens to run into Ida, who's feeling a bit down because of Quagmire struggling to accept her. But you know Brian, single woman plus bar equals go time. Brian. Not if she's got oh. a penis. Two more, please. The two actually hit it off. How anyone falls head over heels for Brian's writer shtick is beyond me. Oh, and I guess the fact that he's a dog too, kinda seems like the first thing most people would take into account, but they talk and talk until care. eventually. You know, we are in a hotel. And I'm in room 406. Ooh, looks like we're getting a little bow chicka, perhaps even some wow wow. Brian returns home rejuvenated and full of life, ready to share the news of the woman of his dreams. I met an amazing woman. Finally, the whole package. He even took a photo of her, consensually, I would hope. Of course, they know about Ida, and they react accordingly. Here, Lois, take a look. <laughs> Regardless of your beliefs, you can't deny that it's hilarious that Brian slept with the parent of the guy who hates him more than anything. It's just, it's too rich. So Brian instead turns to Stewie, who fills him in on all he's missed. Decorated war hero, Lieutenant Commander Dan Quagmire, is now a woman. Brian ironically finds this hysterical, yet when Stewie tells him she's staying at the Marriott, he doesn't put the pieces together. Well, how about a name drop then? What is it, like Danielle or Dana? No, Ida. Yeah, okay there, Bri? Wait, Brian, don't! Don't, not in the house! <laughs> wow, it just keeps going. What could he have eaten? Okay, don't you think this is a little dramatic, but on the bright side- Yes, what could he have eaten that make him lose all breakfast, lunch, and dinner of the last seven months? You know what? Just put in the comment section down below. What do you think Brian ate to give him that stomach ache?
Side, Quagmire finally finds it in his heart to be happy for his father, which is great because she can't wait to tell him all about the nice guy she just met. Really? What's his name? No! Since everyone is being very normal about this, hopefully Brian and Quagmire can chat this out with dignity. Where is he? That's me. I don't know what I would do. I would... Oh, God. Oh, God. Where is that self-centered, arrogant son of a bitch? Yeah, so Quagmire lets him have it. Ooh. I mean, it's not like Brian did anything that wrong. Both were consenting adults in this situation. Though I can see why Quagmire would be upset. Obviously, this isn't going to make their relationship any better, especially with Brian's killer last line. Hey. I your dad. But that isn't the last time Brian would stick his nose in Quagmire's personal life, as he would go on to steal the love of Quagmire's life in Teagues for Two. So we start with Brian sadly drinking in the kitchen, probably realizing all those things Quagmire said about him are true. I'm drinking because I'm sad. Because I'm never gonna meet the right woman. Well, if you're really out of options, maybe you should take Quagmire's dating class. How come I've never heard about this? Because Quagmire forbids us to tell you about his life. As you may recall, he hates you. Really, though, why would you ever take a dating class from Quagmire? It's like taking driving lessons from Stevie Wonder. It's like, yeah, he can probably do it, but more likely than not, it's gonna be ugly. But against his better judgment, Brian decides to attend the class anyway. Guess how thrilled Quagmire is about that. I don't want you in here. Too bad. Here's my class receipt. Now teach me how to find love. You know, Quagmire doesn't strike me as the loving kind of guy. He's more of a mistake that'll occasionally pop back into your brain, haunting you for the rest of your life kind of guy. But oh well, it's your love life's funeral, oh, Brian. I guess the way to get women to like you is to dress like the biggest douche canoe this side of the Mississippi. Yeah. But tonight's the real women test. I'm gonna try out what I've learned on Denise. Judging by your Tony Hawk's underground for the PS2 looking self, I can only hope Denise is into kickflips in 2000's new metal. But of course she's not. She's a regular person, someone this class is not designed to entice. Hey, check your phone, I sent you something. They like that. They do. <gasps> Oh my god, is, is that your- Yeah! So yeah, Brian Don't completely bombs with Denise. This is my shocked face. Can you tell I'm shocked? Brian storms into Quagmire's class, calling him out for all the BS he's been teaching him. This course isn't getting laid, not finding love. So what's the point? Brian makes a good point. After all, Quagmire's still trying to find his way back to Cheryl Teague's. Not sure how ruining the lives of young, unsuspecting women is supposed to help you there, but I won't question the master. Though as it turns out, Cheryl comes back into Quagmire's life after all. Yeah. I- I- Cheryl? Hi, Glenn. But no, this isn't his dream coming true. It's actually his nightmare. Hey, Cheryl, get your fat ass over here before I dump you. <laughs> He's so bossy. I love it. Oh, revenge is so sweet. But only if it's from the revenge region of France, not that cheap revenge you get in California. But it's not over yet. Two can play this dirty game, as evidenced by Quagmire dropping in on Brian and Cheryl's date. Since you guys are already here, I I'd like to treat the four of us to dinner. Well, that sounds absolutely... Wait, four? My new girlfriend. Here she is. Jillian? Ooh, they're using their exes as weapons. Looks like we've got a hell of a dogfight ahead of us. Maybe Jillian should know that you teach a class in picking up women. And Cheryl should know that you took that class. Woof, things are getting heated. At least they're keeping it above the belt. Does Jillian know you're half Polish, Mr. Quagglecheck? You son of a Nobody's gonna call me Polish and get away with it. The two continue to throw hands until the sensible ladies call things off. Maybe you boys will get it together someday, but it looks like that's all you are. Boys. Yeah, boys. Well, it looks like these sad and lonely losers can be sad and lonely together. Maybe it took us stealing each other's girls to finally become friends. Yeah, maybe. Ah, oh, well, I guess this rivalry didn't last as long as I thought. I guess that's a wrap on... Wait, there's still like seven more episodes in this script. <laughs> I don't know about you, but only a true friend would hit you with the back of their car. My friends must really like friend. me. Not but the two friend. have actually forgotten about their rivalry before, and all it took was a little car accident amnesia and forget-me-not. So things start out okay with the gang driving to the bar. Everyone's getting along, a certain guy and dog aren't fighting each other, tranquilo. Peter, look out for that car! That's not a car. What is that? Are they in heaven? Purgatory? The North Pole? Oh, it's just the hospital. But with no universal health care, maybe purgatory was the better option. Who are you? I I don't know. I I just woke up here. Ah, they're doing an amnesia episode. Thoughts? Again. Well, at least this time it's not just Peter, the whole gang gets in on it. This is really weird. We seem perfectly coherent. It's just we can't remember who we are. No, no Biggie, just ask someone to clear things up. Bada bing, bada boom, you can get back to the bar. You should always help yourself to a nice stiff drink when you leave the hospital. That might be hard though, considering nobody is around. What the hell happened? Where is everybody? You don't suppose 
You think we're the only people on Earth? Or, or, this is one big surprise party. Just weighing all the options. So the guys brave the empty streets, eventually figuring out where they live based on Brian's nose. I poop a lot on this lawn. This must be where I live. Yeah, yeah, let's go with that. And judging by that picture of Quagmire hanging in the house, Brian is either his dog or a huge creepy fan. You're my owner! I knew it! I knew we were pals! So in a different timeline, Quagmire and Brian could be friends, and all it takes is losing every memory about you and the people around you. Thanks for nothing, Doctor Strange. But I see you've got a dog collar and a leash. And look how big your doggy cage is! You could fit a human in there! Please, for the love of God, have the hindsight to wipe down everything in there before you touch it. Well, the relationship seems short-lived as Brian is able to annoy Quagmire in record time. Should, should I be the one writing about this? Uh, I don't know. I, I think it should be me. And just do it. Stop talking about it, for God's sake. Even when he doesn't know he's a pretentious writer, Brian is such a pretentious writer. So the guys get together to try to figure out what the heck is going on, eventually spotting a gag newspaper clipping from when Peter won laser tag. Oh my God. It's him. He did this. What do we do? I don't know. Maybe stop and think about how anyone could have printed a newspaper if no one was around to do it. I swear some of these problems can be fixed with just five seconds of common sense. But the guys entertain this theory, believing Peter must have kept them alive for a reason. Maybe we're important. I mean, I do have all- I am scared to see the pair of titties that would fit into that lopsided bra. Biggie Smalls would be the nickname of that female. All these profound ideas and thoughts. Maybe I was a deep thinker of some kind. Sure, Brian, and you and Quagmire are definitely best friends. You know, this actually Don't reminds me out. of a quote by Milton. Don't Shut up. Now there's only one Biggie reasonable little, thing to do. They're gonna have to kill this guy. While Quagmire and Joe get guns, Brian will have to keep an eye on Peter. Oh, come on, why me? Cause I'm your owner and I said so. Quagmire really seems like the leaves his dog outside all the time kind of dog owner. What else can you expect from a cat guy? Yuck. But who would have guessed it? Brian and Peter actually get along pretty well. Almost like they were friends in a past life. When Joe and Quagmire return, he tries to talk them out of killing him. When they refuse, Brian tries to save Peter, even taking a bullet for him. That is such... Ah! Bullcrap! <sighs> Sorry, lost my cool there. But come on, another episode where it was all simulation like Lois kills Stewie? Whatever, at least we got to see Brian and Quagmire try and be friends, pretty much solidifying there's no way in hell they can make it work. And Brian and Quagmire are back on their BS when Brian scams Quagmire with a bad rental property and Brian the Closer. So things get off to a gruesome start when Peter and Brian are fighting over a rope toy. Classic dog versus man baby scenario. But in typical Peter fashion, he takes it too far and turns Brian's nose into a sock filled with meat. My teeth! A few seconds in and I'm already tired of looking at this episode. That's always a good sign. Brian goes to the bar to drink away his sorrows, kept company by his best pal in the world, Quagmire. Your face looks like a used condom. Yeah, I know. And now he's crying. Don't you hate it when someone does that in public and now all of a sudden you have to play therapist? Just take this. What is this? That's my dentist. He'll bill me, I've got an account. Wow, is Quagmire actually being nice to Brian? Even if it's just to shut him up, that's quite a nice gesture. I won't forget this, Glenn Quagmire. Yeah, but I'm looking forward to forgetting that sad elephant trunk Brian calls a face. So Brian returns home with a set of nice new chompers. The whole family loves him, but I don't know. Were they out of dog teeth and had to use horses? But these teeth give Brian a new lease on life, feeling confident and proud wherever he goes. He looks so charming that he actually gets confused for a real estate agent. Can we ask you a few questions? Uh, yeah, sure. His smile lands him a nice little job with a real estate agency. Wouldn't that be nice, getting a job just by your smile? You walk into an interview, don't even hand them a resume and just go... He gets so good at his job that his boss proposes a little challenge to sell a piece of crap condo. You find some sucker to buy it, and I'll make you partner. But what sucker could Brian possibly find for a sale like that? I am flush. For the first time in my life, I got money to burn. Oh, come on. You're going to screw over the guy who helped you while you were at your lowest? Normally, I feel kind of bad for how Quagmire treats Brian, but nah. He's getting everything that's coming to him with this stunt. So Brian decides to sweet talk him, butter him up a bit, and even pay him back the money for the procedure. I just wish I could do something more for you. Oh, you're too kind, Brian, you little scumbag. Brian sits Quagmire down and actually convinces him to go in on the property. But come on, the ceiling is a pool? Who needs health insurance or retirement funds when you can have that? But when the guys go to check the place out, not only is there no pool ceiling, there's not much of anything. What am I gonna do? 
I sank my entire bonus into this place! Luckily, Lawyer Joe says Quagmire can back out of the deal within 72 hours of finalizing. But now they've got to find Brian. If I was in the dog's shoes, I'd be halfway across the country by now. With the clock ticking, Brian decides to hide out at a motel. Why a motel, though? That's like the universal beacon for people who are trying to hide. No one stays in motels anymore. You might as well be shouting, Hey, I'm on the run from the rooftop! Welcome home. Ah, hey there, buddy. There you are. Quagmire tries to strong arm his way out of the deal, but Brian, being the beaver toothed weasel that he is, tries to convince him otherwise. Screwing over the people who helped you? I don't know how you sleep at night. Probably at the foot of Peter and Lois's bed. No, oh, that's not what he meant. Brian does seem to realize the error of his ways, calling himself a pretentious and egotistical jerk. That's actually a pretty noble and mature self reflection from Brian. Maybe he isn't as bad as Quagmire. And that is 72 hours. Enjoy your crap, old dumb ass. Never mind. Knock his teeth out, Quagmire. If you ever think these two's rivalry is one-sided, don't forget that Brian brings a lot of this on himself. But Quagmire and Brian take their war to the political field when they both run for mayor in Adam West High. Unfortunately, we have to start the episode off on a sad note, as the show addresses the death of Mayor Adam West not long after the real Adam West passed away. This is the one character death in the show that actually makes sense. <coughs> Brian. <coughs> But he'll always be remembered, especially now that the high school is renamed after the legendary actor to hating each other when Brian and Ida get involved again in Brida. So we first see Ida at the bar watching a video of her son getting it on with a girl who was accidentally live streamed. Worst day of her life, but the best day ever for a certain dog. Howdy, stranger. Brian? What are you doing here? I'm an alcoholic. Quagmire's most embarrassing moment seems like the perfect time to hit on his parents, right? Never mind the ocean of vomit you had from a few episodes ago, I guess. As much as you want to save your kids from their mistakes, it's their mistakes that help them grow and change. Oh, she is eating this pseudo-intellectual crap up. Except for a job and your own home, you are the full package, Brian Griffin. Hey, Brian said the you same thing about her. Vagina. Maybe they really are meant to be. Well, they have- Her vagina ain't even authentic. What you got? Would you get- Isn't it just like a painted on hole? Like a Looney Tunes cartoon featuring the, the Roadrunner? another one night stand but brian actually may want some probably the crazier thing to note it's like night at the museum in here how well you know like the guys are gonna come to life welp you learn something new every day you do not f around about night at the museum with quagmire be very very careful treading around night at the museum we've all got that one movie for me it's garfield 2 a tale of two kitties you joke about that film and i will end you well maybe for me, it's the Dragon Ball Z Broly movie, the latest one. There was no mistakes made in that movie at all. Yeah, Quagmire can't do this. He could forgive sleeping with Brian once, but dating him? That's too much. And now you've had time to adjust and your choice is Brian? Why in God almighty would you choose him? Fair point. I'm not even super convinced Brian is and whatnot. Food or drink shall not be prepared or consumed within 20 feet of fecal matter. Yeah, but if the fecal matter is 21 feet away from you, then you're all good. Go crazy. It looks like all of Brian's protesting pays off as Joe informs him of the good news. 20 feet of fecal matter. Yeah, but if the fecal matter is 21 feet away from you, then you're all good. Go crazy. It looks like all of Brian's protesting pays off as Joe informs him of the good news. The city is... The city has said that no animals of any kind are allowed in any public establishment. Yeah, Brian, did you forget that you yourself were an animal? For real, you're wearing a collar. Only goths and animals wear those, and I'm not seeing any black lipstick on you. Now banned from all bars, Brian starts to tweak out and shuffle around home. How about signing up for an AA meeting? I haven't been able to go anywhere. No dogs allowed in public places. Meanwhile, Quagmire is swimming in a sea of alive and dead cats at home. Uh, how's it going? I got a dead cat on a pitchfork. I don't even know which can to put it in. Eh, I just put whatever in whatever. The trash gods will sort it out. So with Brian angrily sober and Quagmire having to burn a mountain of dead cats, things finally explode between the two of them. You son of a bitch, this is all your fault. Both punch around for a bit before the two come to their senses and Brian apologizes for being a massive D-bag. I'm sorry I destroyed your dream, Quagmire. I know you loved that cafe. The two make up and oh my god, they're going on a walk together? Maybe there's hope for them yet. 
Remember, if you have a disagreement with someone, just punch each other for a bit and you'll learn to respect one another. Or you'll be dead. Either way, you won't have to worry about it anymore. But Quagmire did have to worry about his dog-loving fiance finding out he hates dogs and must love dogs. So Quagmire is seeing a woman named Carrie and judging by the fact that they're being seen in public together, she hasn't found out what a creepy weirdo Quagmire is yet. But he almost lets the worst thing about him slip out. He hates dogs. Who brings a dog to a coffee shop? I love dogs. Without letting me pet it. <laughs> Carrie is a huge dog lover, and I guess that means Quagmire is now too. Carrie suggests that their next date be at the dog park with their dogs, and Quagmire agrees. Now if only he knew a dog. Quagmire decides to ask Brian if he'll pretend to be his dog, but he's gonna have to drive a hard bargain to get him to do that. There are not enough tennis balls in the world for me I to- I have six. I'll do it. Okay, so like 10 bucks, but they're worth millions in dog money. So all Brian needs to do is just act like a normal, non-talking dog. Brack. Brack? What the hell is that? Look, Glenn, if you wanted a proper Bracken dog, you could have adopted a Bracken dog yourself. Brack off. Brian's mostly doing this to watch Quagmire crash and burn, so you know he's going to do everything he can to see him fail. You're just going to bail and leave her in the dust. Hey, how's your son, Brian? Better off not being in his life. How's your daughter, Quagmire? Quagmire admits the truth. He's in love with her. Well, we've been here before, and if it's anything like last time, someone might end up dead. Well, Brian is going to see just how much he loves her by staging a fake proposal at the Griffin house. Will you marry me? What's his name? Oh my god, Glenn. Yes, yes, of course I'll marry you. Masterful gambit, Mr. Brian Edward Griffin. But Quagmire actually seems happy about this. That is, until he realizes Carrie has a few more dogs than he thought. Dexter eats all this? Not just Dexter, but Dexter and all his rescue brothers and sisters. Wow, that woman is a saint. Unfortunately, she's getting married to the biggest sinner in town. Quagmire does his best to coexist with 50-something dogs, but Brian gets to enjoy drinking in a sweet, sweet I told you so. Shut up, Brian. Why don't you go for a walk? No, 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 no walk, no walk, no, no, we're not going for a walk. Saying walk to a dog is like saying the activation word for a sleeper soldier. You gotta be prepared for the consequences. But it's time for the engagement party, and Quagmire almost forgets the flea-ridden reality he's stepped up into. I first met Carrie and her niece a couple of weeks ago on Halloween. Thank God they decided to take that walk. Oh no. And now we're headed down the aisle. A very different kind of walk. Come on, say something else! Stroll, strut, stride! If I may borrow a line from our favorite song, I would walk 500 miles. All hell breaks loose, which causes Quagmire to finally break himself. I hate dogs. Is this maybe where Quagmire's hate for Brian stems? Does he just hate all dogs and by extension, Brian? Well, Brian is the only one he knows who can talk to him, so I'm sure that doesn't help either. But Brian does manage to offer some genuine help to Quagmire when Stewie gets lost in Paris in the Stewie way. So things first go awry when Stewie and Brian decide to play hide and seek. But like the tired parent version where the kid hides and no one looks for them, a classic of my childhood. Anyway, Stewie comes across the perfect place to hide, a front yard suitcase. Oh, baby, that's the spot. But that suitcase has places to be, going all the way to Paris with Quagmire. Stewie? Mr. Quagmire? Terrence. And the sweaty clam, yay! Quagmire sweaty isn't clam. too jazzed about this impromptu babysitting ordeal, but the two actually get along pretty well. Normally, I wouldn't want Quagmire 100 feet from a child, or any place that houses children, but I'm glad they're getting along well. The two see all the sights, the Louvre, the Mona Lisa, and the little corner bistros for wines like $5. Now that's a bargain. But the wine flows a bit too heavy and both are drunk as hell. I know the drinking age is lower in France than in America, but is it really one years old? I love you, man. I love you too, man. All right, so to understand Stewie, you either have to be another baby, Brian, Chris, or just really, really drunk. Got it. The two drunkenly try to make it back to the hotel, but a sleeping Quagmire loses track of Stewie. Stewie, where are you? Quagmire scours the city, but can't find Stewie anywhere. Out of options, he's forced to make a deal with the devil himself. Glenn Quagmire, what is up? Brian is the last person Quagmire would call, but he knows Stewie better than anyone and might be able to help find him. First class and no male flight attendants in my area. Fine. I knew airlines could do that. Sure, Brian. Glad you're getting a nice fancy flight while your best friend is lost in Paris. Happy to see you have your priorities in order. But once the pair do get together, it's right back to their good old all-American bickering. Should we look in, like, a park? In like a park? I flew you out here for this level of insight? Easy, Glenn. You're the one who got a baby drunk and lost him. If this was a country with actual rules, you'd be in big trouble. I lost him. And now he's gone, and it's all my fault. 
I'm a loser. Uh, Brian, if I were you, I'd be recording this for later. But Brian actually feels bad for Quagmire and agrees to continue to help. Thankfully, they come across the graveyard Quagmire and Stewie were going to visit and find him crying inside. That's all well and good, but Brian did nothing really to help. He didn't sniff him out or 